Good evening and welcome to this regular meeting of the Planning Board in the City of Birmingham for Wednesday, October 27, 2021. Could we please call the roll? Present. 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 Here. 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 Brian Williams. Here. Janelle Boyce. Here. Jason Emmer. Here. Lucy Roman. Here. Daniel Murphy. Jane Weinman. Here. That's a here, Laura. She's in the she's in person. Yep. I got it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Excellent. Excellent. We are court. Let's uh, move on to review and approval of the minutes from Wednesday, October 13th. Any comments or corrections therein? Start over here, Mr. Jeffries. Yeah, this, um, I'm sure Dan will cover this one. But, uh, um, on the uh, page two, <coughs> the chair client said the mechanical equipment needs not to be screened, yada, yada, yada. He said the applicant should also should. I think it's also show. Is your mic on? Oh, okay, sorry. Um, Where are you? Uh, page two, second line, said the applicant should also show, I'm guessing, auto turn on the site plans? Yes. Okay. <coughs> um, then this, my next comment is, um, if you're in the meeting, this is probably isn't confusing, but in the light unlikelihood that somebody actually reads this elsewhere, and I guess they might because of, of if this goes for a variance or whatever, we, we use the term north side. Uh, Mr. Kosick, that line, north side. Mr. Boyle, north side. And I think when we say north side, we're not talking about the wall along Brown. We're talking the one along Woodward on the north side. So I think Correct. we need to. It really should be northeast. northeast. Northeast, perhaps, yeah. Correct. That's a good point. Change um, north to northeast. How many places? So it's in it's uh, in the Mr. Kosick paragraph, Mr. Boyle paragraph, Mr. Uh, Millen or Milan at the end. It's even the paragraph above that, Mr. Cher Williams, Jeffries Kozak. I mean. Oh, yeah. Okay. On the north side, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, also it's um, on the next page, on page three, the second paragraph, Mr. Jeffrey said he was worried about an unapproved drive lane on the northeast side. Okay. Um, uh, and then, but then, going the other way, just to make sure it's clear, the Mr. Shear said the minutes should reflect the board's understanding that it is a break in the wall. That that break is on the north wall. Along Brown. Along Brown, yeah. Correct. So that's mm -hmm. that's all my comments. Okay, any other comments, corrections? Yep, I have one too. Um, at, on page two, um, where I, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Hang on. Um, the part about me saying <coughs> that car wash should be removed from both sides, I, I did say that, but it was, um, in reference to me preferring the frontage beyond Woodward. So I, I think it would be important to, to add that. I um, I don't remember exactly how, but this was right around the discussion of where to put the frontage and I was supportive of the frontage being Woodward Avenue. Okay. Any other comments, corrections? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve as amended? Motion to approve. Motion by Mr. Uh, Jeffries. Is second. there a second? Second, Ms. Boyce. Any conversation at the board level? Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? No, nope, it is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, Chair's comment, uh, we have a hybrid meeting tonight. There will be an opportunity for the public to provide input, uh, whether you're here in person and wish to do so, uh, or whether you are watching at home on Zoom. I will call at each event an, uh, a moment when the public may provide comment. If you're here, come forward to the microphone, give your name and place of residence and provide your comment. If you are at home, please use the raise your hand function in Zoom. I will have a list of the participants up and we will make sure that you are allowed to provide your feedback. 
Uh, last thing, board, just with all of us wearing masks and with the uh, electronic equipment, if we could just make sure we try and speak up um, to make sure that it we're clear in, in the record, that would be appreciated. Uh, Nick, is there any change to the agenda as published? No changes. That's what I like to hear. So let's move forward into, uh, well, items H and I, which is the special land use permit and site plan and design review for 203 Pierce Street, toast. Uh, board, these are two separate approvals that we will have to consider, but they are so intertwined, we will likely listen to the comments all at once. And it looks like, Brooks, you are up. Yep. Good evening. Take us through. Evening, everyone. Brooks Gallon, the City Planning Department, uh, presenting on 203 Pierce Street, toast. They are applying for a special land use permit amendment for their hours of operation. For some background on the application, uh, they've been a bistro since 2008, and a part of their initial application was that the city required them to be open during dinner hours uh, up to 12 a.m. on the weekends. Uh, and then in around 2018, um, there was change in ownership, change in manage management, uh, were apparently unaware of their slup requirements, and they began closing a bit earlier. Uh, they were brought back to the city, and during their liquor license review in 2019, they were proposing closing a bit earlier. City commission had indicated they'd like them to be open for dinner, um, and so they tried to work out a compromise. And then in 2019, let me flip to those hours. Uh, 2019, they amended their slup to uh, close on Wednesdays at 8 p.m., Thursday through Friday at 8 p.m., and then Saturday at 9 p.m., which is a reduction from the uh, midnight hours previously. Uh, and then COVID <coughs> happened, um, and then it seems like they've been closing at 3 to 4, we were made aware of. They were given a notice of violation, and so now they're back here applying to close earlier. Um, and I'll let the applicant cite the reasons why they would like to do so. Um, they're proposing to close at 3 p.m. Monday through Friday and 4 p.m. Saturday and Sunday. So there's no changes to the site plan uh, as of now. Uh, what, what we time, do what, what time are they proposing to open? You have either mention. Sorry. Open 7 a.m. Monday through Friday and then 8 a.m. Uh, Saturday, Sunday, open for breakfast and lunch. So, uh, no changes to the site plan. We do want to bring up, um, we've had some complaints on the five foot clearance walkway, um, especially with this table right here, that circular one, mm -hmm. where it can either be a code enforcement issue where we send them out there, ask them to move the chairs and maintain the five feet, you know, or as a part of the slope amendment, we request that they uh, reduce the number of seats at that chair in order to help ensure that we can have a five foot walkway clearance at that location. Um, so in regards to uh, zoning ordinance requirements for slope amendments, um, they, they meet the bistro requirements as listed above. They are amending their hour, hours of operation uh, for design review, they meet all of the tables and chair requirements um, in regards to the downtown plan. Uh, the plan encourages a mix of uses in the downtown to encourage visitors and social activation morning, afternoon, and night. Uh, we marked that Toast is within the downtown 2016 plan's central business district retail loop, which consists of Pierce, Merrill, Woodward, and Maple. Uh, this loop allows pedestrians to walk in a consecutive loop without having to cross the street. Uh, and in the report, we listed all the various restaurants within that loop. Uh, there is a number of them, um, and they're all open at different hours, providing breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So providing options for visitors to downtown Birmingham. So the planning division finds that the proposed slope amendment adequately enhances the street life along this loop during breakfast and lunch hours within the downtown and thus helping to promote a pedestrian friendly environment. And in regards to site plan and slope requirements, they appear to satisfy criteria of 7.27 and 7.36. Uh, they support the economic vitality of Pierce Street between 
uh, West Maple and Merrill during morning and afternoon hours for seven days a week. Uh, they have no days where they're closed. And so for the suggested action, uh, Planning Division recommends the Planning Board recommend approval to the City Commission of the applicant's request for the SLUP amendment and final site plan review. Uh, it's also recommended that the terminology uh, minimum hours of operation be included into the SLUP agreement. Um, that would enable the applicant to stay open later than what they're proposing uh, if it's economically feasible, if they wanted to. Uh, that term was used in their 2019 amendment. Uh, our recommendation is based on the consideration that the applicant is open and providing dining services to patrons um, at times when other restaurants and bistros are not providing those services. Um, and uh, a planning recommendation is that if the city wishes to deny the applicant's request and require Toast to maintain current dinner hours Wednesday through Saturday, that we recommend the city consider a temporary social district on Pierce Street from Merrill to the alley, uh, similar to what Royal Oak, Ferndale, and Northville have in order to help activate that space and potentially bring some life to that area along Pierce. So with that, I leave it to the board for questions. Questions and for Brooks. Um, Mr. Jeffries. The, um, <clears throat> the um, hours in um, the attorney letter are different than the hours in your report. Is the one in, did they, did they what, change? What, uh, what page are you looking at? Uh, page, uh, your second page of your document versus the ones on page 18. It's page two of four of the letter. Yeah. Both and both. Yeah. The big change is the starting time. Starting time. Yeah. I mean, it's not a big deal. I just want we to just gotta get it right. make sure we get it right. Yeah. We'll have the applicant come forward and clarify that for us, okay? All right. Okay. Any other questions before we do that? Mr. Williams. Well, it's not a question. I think we need to... Uh, um, Except for filing uh, an email from Sean Cameron from the Birmingham Shopping District, which was on our uh, tables, dated 10-26-21. Uh, so I'll move that we receive and file the uh, email from Sean Cameron to uh, Brooks. Oh, yeah, if I could go over that. Let, well, we've well, got a motion first. Let's separate. finish through the process. Then we'll let you quickly support. Motion, Mr. Williams. Support, Mr. Uh, Scher. Is there any conversation? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Excellent. I have Number a second Williams. question, and that is, on Pierce, um, there are at least, what, three other bistros, one cornering on Pierce. What are their hours of operation in the morning and the afternoon? I don't know their exact hours of operation. I know that Ely's and... Uh, street side are open, more of a lunchtime, dinner time right. operation. Uh, townhouse, I know that they're open for brunch on the weekends. However, I don't know their exact breakfast time hours during the weekdays. Okay. I, I, I looked at a, up a bunch of these. I can tell you street side's open 39 hours a week, and Ely's is 66 hours, and townhouse is 69 hours. But okay. But mostly nighttime? Yeah, none of them are open for breakfast. Townhouse has a brunch, I think. But well, a weekend, weekend brunch? Weekend brunch, I think. Well, yeah. it starts later, though, I think. Okay. Cool. Other questions before we move on? Yeah, um, what exactly is a temporary social district trial on Pierce? Right, I wanted to recommend and get the conversation started if the planning board was interested in considering that in, um, you know, getting the ball rolling on doing some kind of social district for that area. I don't know uh, what that means. Can you describe for me what yeah, What's a what social district, Brooks? Sure. Social district is when you're allowed to buy an alcoholic beverage within a liquor license establishment and then being able to walk around on the sidewalk or on the street within an established district um, as determined by state law. And so the city would have to determine this is our social district from end to end, and it can be a certain amount of feet from uh, the liquor establishments. And 
therefore, you know, people will be able to walk from one restaurant to another with alcoholic beverage. Uh, you could have seats outside along the sidewalk or the street if the city wanted to evaluate that. Um, other cities have been using it since COVID to kind of activate the space and get people outside and encouraging social <clears throat> interactivity. Um, I have one last question before we go to the applicant. Uh, just for the record, I don't believe it does. Does the ordinance specifically for bistros require dinner hours? It does not specifically require dinner okay. hours. That, that was a part of their original approval, so it's certainly why they're here, but it's not an ordinance strict requirement. Right. The hours were part of the SLUP amendment. However, Perfect. there's nothing in the ordinance requiring okay. dinner time. Thank you. I see the applicant is here. We'd like to come forward and maybe clarify the hours and talk us through a little bit about why and Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Board. I'm Kelly Allen here tonight with Regan Bloom and Tony Mancelli, um, the owner and manager of Toast. Just a, you know, a little bit of history and, and with regard to what you're looking up for other establishments. I, I represent a few and I don't think any of their slops require them to be open at specific hours. And I think you'll find, I, I did this with my son a few weeks ago, and you drive around Birmingham now because of the, the, the crisis everyone is having with staffing, and people just aren't open. I mean, people are open that you, you can't find a place to go to lunch. The only place we could find was Market that was open during the day. Um, so I mean, that's sort of a side issue, but I do think it's important. Everybody knows that Toast was one of the very first bistros to be approved. And um, when they came to town, the city was concerned about activating the street, because that's what the bistro ordinance is for. And when they are primarily a, a breakfast, lunch, brunch type of place, that, that was sort of imposed upon them in return for giving them the opportunity and to, to be zoned as a bistro and to, to have a liquor license here. So obviously things have changed. Um, the bistro ordinance has, was a smashing success. I can't talk with this thing. <laughs> and um, there are lots of bistros up and down this particular corridor. This is the third time, I think, Toast has come back for um, a bite at the apple. The last time the city commission uh, really wasn't having it and, and, and pushed back on, on the dinner hours. And again, um, I don't think it's necessary. They're doing the best they, best they can. They are open seven days a week. The hours, the specifically the hours are eight, not seven, to three and four is outlined. So the only, the only disconnect was between the seven o'clock and eight o'clock hour. And I, I mean, they, they are staying open for those hours and, and I'm, I'm hoping that they will be treated like others and that they shouldn't have hours imposed upon them. They're willing to abide by these hours and um, it will be a success for them and, and I think for the city as well. They can answer any other questions that you might have. Questions? Maybe I'll ask one to, to help get your story out for the record. The model of toast, perhaps, different than the model of other restaurants, especially on that street. Is it, can, can you talk about that? What is it really geared toward? You know, it, it began as a, I like, I tell like, us a little bit about why. I like why. the owners to do that. Sure. Sorry. All I do is eat. <laughs> <laughs> so the model of toast has always been. Could, could you please introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Yourself. Regan Bloom, owner of toast uh, in Thank Birmingham you, and Ferndale. Our model has always been daytime. I'm a breakfast and lunch place, brunch. It's where we do so much business between the hours of eight and three. We are just absolutely crammed with trying to get enough staff in to be able to handle the amount of business that we're doing. And I feel like that's just, well, that's our sweet spot. That's what we do. Dinner was like, okay, we have to, we'll try and make it happen. But for us, I feel like we're the spot in Birmingham to, that's where people come for breakfast and lunch. And that's where we want to stay in our lane, let other people do dinner and we do what we're good at. Okay. Appreciate that. Any other questions for the applicant? No, Mr. Jefferson? No, just no, when you get down, Okay. So. Well, um, yeah, Mr. Chair. So would you just talk to us since the the reason to... Uh, Why did you wait till you got to your seat before? Uh, exactly. <laughs> we give you your exercise for the night. Um, the reason that you want to drop the hour from 7 to 8, I think it was weekdays. Um, you know, I, I haven't been going out for breakfast in a while, but I used to go at 7. 
what uh, is that a labor issue? Is that a business issue? It's not necessarily a labor issue. It's a lot of people are now working from home. We don't have the amount of people hitting offices early like they used to. We used to be really busy at 7 a.m. and that was part of the, you know, that we, it was really good for us. But now it's just after COVID, there's just a lot of people working from home and they're just not, we don't have those kind of hours. If we did, we'd open back up at seven because obviously we're a daytime place. And that's not that much of a stretch. It's just an issue of people are just working a different lifestyle. So if we said minimal hours and you saw people wanting to come at 7, you'd, you'd open it. Yeah, absolutely. Why okay. not? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any other questions before she sits down? <laughs> I'll wait till she sits down. <laughs> I run away. There we go. All right. At this point, before we bring it back to the board, let's just see if anyone in the public likes to comment. Anyone here in the room? Anyone online watching the meeting? If so, use the raise your hand function. And I do not see... I don't see any hands going on. I'm not sure I see any general public on there as well. So we'll bring it back to the board. All right, board, Mr. Jeffries. All right. I think when we've seen this, we had maybe had a little different take in the past than the city Can't commission. Yeah. So some of my, I think in the past when we've looked at this, we've had a little different take than the city commission perhaps. So my comments maybe are more for the record so they can see what we think now. Um, I, I will say one, uh, one of the major changes since last time they were there here is we just approved whistle stop and whistle stop totals point blank, we close at three. I don't know how you do that. Um, I also looked up all the, all the bistros in the area. Bella Piatti is only open, is open half the hours of toast. And when I consider activation, I don't know why before 11 o'clock is not important to us. I have bought more crap from Mountain Repair and Paper Source because I was waiting to get in at Toast. And if you go ask those guys, they will tell you they make money off of Toast. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think they're, they activate at a different time when nobody else is activating. And it's kind of like they wake Birmingham up. And we got other people who put it to bed. So I, I just am totally. And, and oh, when they did do dinner, we'd go there. And you know why? Nobody was there. Yeah. Guaranteed table. So I don't think the city should be in the business of forcing businesses out of business. If this works for them, I, I'm happy with it. Yeah, the, Mr. Boyle. A slightly different topic. I, I, I just walked through town and I walked past Commonwealth. And I, I was interested to see what Commonwealth looks like right now. They've taken their outdoor deck down and there are cars parked out front. I then walked along Maple and then came down Pierce. And the one thing that struck me was the darkness of the toast area. Not because you were necessarily closed, but because the deck sat out there and it was very dark. So I think we need to sort of put these things together and be holistic to some extent. That if we are going to have uh, a, a variety of different times, which I'm in favour of. I'm absolutely in favour of allowing toast to continue without doing dinner. But on the, on the other hand, I might also want to encourage them to actually take the deck in for the winter because it is very dark at that end. It doesn't activate Pierce. You only begin to see the, the colour and movement when you can see Townhouse or you're coming up from the south and you see um, the two restaurants that are directly across the road. So I think when we get to this broader debate about activating the street, we do need to think about what the winter will be like with decks that aren't used from four o'clock in the afternoon on. Yeah, fair point. Any other comments? I, uh, yes, sir. Only okay. a quick bit of clarification. Um, decks are actually currently right now, and it's funny I'm mentioning this now because we're going to talk about it later, but decks are actually not currently allowed past November 15th. So the deck right now would have to come down in the Thank winter. Thank you. Yes. And they have done that in the past. Brooks, you had mentioned something about the five-foot clear zone, and I don't want that lost in this discussion of, of uh, free toast. Um, <laughs> could, do you have us anything that you can show us? I mean, we, you know me. That's a big issue for me. We, you know. Whatever comes out of tonight, there must be five foot clear. And whether that table just has to go or what, I don't care. But um, is that, is that the scale? best we got? Yeah, that's. Oh, no. oh God. 
I got to say, I, I walk by there a lot. I've never noticed that being an issue. Well, uh, here, let me make a comment. <laughs> go, go back, go, go back. That's not bad. Maybe the next one more. One more. No, keep no, going. No. Keep going. All the way back. One of the first ones you showed, right? Nope, they're right there. Let me say this. I, your slup already requires you to maintain a five foot clear. So I'm not going to get on you tonight about reconfiguring this when all we have are some photos. But do you, you, it's not even a favor. You have five foot clear, all right? You know, your expert restaurant owners. That means getting rid of that table, just get rid of it. Whatever you need to do, make sure you've got five foot clear. For the rest of the board and for anybody who want a sneak peek of one of the biggest things that I'm going to be talking about tonight on outdoor dining, it's this. Um, and with no offense intended toward the applicant, that cannot stand when we get done with all of this. A five foot gated pathway, hallway, down the middle of the sidewalk so we've got dining on both sides and you're, you're fenced in. I mean, uh, don't get me started now, it's not their fault. But, <laughs> but the, uh, let's keep going. Bring this up later on. Yes, we, I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Page 39. Yeah, I'll just close by saying that I agree with Mr. Jeffries. I see no land planning reason why they should be forced to have dinner. We just did approve whistle stop. It's a planning, it's a policy issue. It's, it's per right. clearly the purview of the city commission. And I understand where they were five, ten years ago. They were, it was new. And I, I get it. It was kind of scary. We're given this, this precious thing. We don't know if it's going to work to someone that might not be open. But times have changed. It's different. Um, I have no, per no issue with this whatsoever. Uh, so with that, we've already been to the public. Is anybody interested in moving this forward in one way or another? I'll make a motion. This boys. Uh, and again, we probably need two motions because there's both a special land use and oh, a that's true, isn't final it? site plan. I think we only have one sample motion here. Or on, two. We just have one or combined, so just it's pretty straightforward maybe. Okay, so... Sorry. So, okay. Um... Are you suggesting I combine them? No, I'm not. No. Pull them apart. Pull them apart. Um, I recommend, uh, Planning Board recommends approval to the City Commission of the Special Land Use. Amendment. Permit amendment. Permit amendment. For 203. For 203 toast. 203 Pierce? Pierce. Ah, toast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Motion this voice. I get Mr. Boyle. That's, I think, for, for clarity, we ought to include, given the, um, Ambiguity or inconsistency in the record with minimum hours of eight to th three on weekdays and eight to four on Saturday and Sunday. Okay, I okay. accept that. You both accept that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. Any um, conversation at a board level on the motion? So you not any public comment on the motion itself? Public comment here, any public comment on Zoom? Seeing them, we'll bring it back. Let's call the roll. Janelle Wolfboys? Yes. Robin Boyle? Yes. Scott Klein? Yes. Stuart Jeffries? Yes. Bert Kosek? Yes. Daniel Sherr? Yes. Brian Williams? Yes. Wonderful motion unanimous. So that is the special land use permit amendment. Yep. Oh, site plan. Site plan. I'll do it. Site plan. I've got this. You just did the special land use, though, correct? Right, correct. I, that's I, what I, I mean. That's why I was just making use. sure we're on the same mm -hmm. page, please. Okay. Uh, planning Board recommends approval to the City Commission of the final site plan review for 203 Pierce Toast. Including? Including the same. Including the hours of operation, uh, same as the special land use permit amendment. That's fine. Thank you. Motion, Ms. Boyce. Second, Mr. Boyle. Any conversation at the board? Any public comment on the motion itself? Anyone on Zoom? Bring it back. Let's call a roll on that as well, please. Janelle Wolfe-Boyce? Yes. Robin Boyle? Yes. Scott Klein? Yes. Stuart Jeffries? Yes. Robert Kosak? Yes. Daniel Sher? Yes. Brian Williams? Yes. Excellent. Motion unanimous. Thank you much. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> 
So let us move along to the next item, which I believe is a public hearing on wall art ordinance, correct? Correct. That, Brooks, is that you as well? That is me. He is Mr. Public Art. Mr. Public Art. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yes, indeed. Um, so the last meeting we talked about allowing wall art to be placed on the side of buildings with a zero foot setback in the downtown and the Triangle District when they're not allowed to have windows because they anticipate another building to be built alongside it. So the terminology uh, side elevations with a zero foot setback in the Triangle District and downtown overlay district was added for permitted locations. And with that, I leave it to the board for the public hearing. All right. Board, uh, any conversation on, the, on these changes? Mr. Chair, please. Uh, um, if I can get to the suggested ordinance language, I think there's one thing we ought to... Could you speak up a little bit? I'm Mr. sorry. Sure, please. If we can get to the which, which page is the suggested ordinance language on? It'd be 71 through 71 of your packet. Yeah, yeah 71 of the packet. Um, talking about the ordinance language or the suggested action? No, it's the ordinance language. Mr. Chair, I'm looking? sorry, I got it. In the last okay. sentence, part, I apologize, I didn't, my notes weren't. Gonna, um, so when it says wall art is not permitted in an alley, passage, or via, I think it, the in an alley, I don't think is what, exactly what we want to say because you wouldn't put wall art in an alley. The alley is the, you know, the, uh, the, pavement, the driving the pavement uh, and the area above it. So I think we're talking about on a building facing um, an alley in the V activation overlay, so on and so forth. I mean, I think that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I would suggest we change the, you know, in an alley to on a, on a facing building an alley? facing an alley passage building, over facing Nick, what do you think? I don't think that necessarily is a more restrictive you know, issue that would cause us to have to, to push this to another public hearing. I mean, we're, we're clarifying a content. Would you agree? We've done similar small changes like this before. Okay. Any board member have any issue with such a small I, I, change? Mr. Boyle. Um, well, I, I actually was going to bring this up. Um, it may have slipped my mind or I may not have been here, but I'd like to hear from uh, Brooks as to why we would necessarily not want to have art on the sides of buildings Beside an alley. Uh, that last sentence, uh, at the very end, that abuts a single-family residential zoned property. Oh, apologies. So uh, that was brought up by the Design Review Board. Exactly. Uh, well, because of my ignorance there, it might be helpful if we punctuate that, perhaps, because it, it, it reads to some extent that wall art is not permitted in an alley and passage or via that abuts a single family residential zoned property. Um, could somebody misread that and think I can't put a mural up in, an, uh, in a building on an alley? Or am I, am I just getting too... You know, I'm not sure. Too, much, too, too, uh, too far into I mean, the weeds. I think you, you, you sure can you clarify by saying any of which abuts a single family residential. Thank you. Sure. So I think that would be good. Clarify it. Fair enough. A minor change. Yes, Nick. I would agree that's quite minor. Okay, that it's helps me. Still the same concept. I, I was just a little confused in what Mr. Shear was saying. I just so in an alley, the walls is the They're walls not in of the, the alley. They're huh? on private the alley. property. What? The walls are on private property, not within the 
public alley, the public right of way, unless they encroach. So I think his point is clarifying that we're not talking about painting the alley, we're talking about painting <laughs> a building that abuts an alley. Yeah. It's a minor point, but I think. Don't paint the ground, paint the wall. Don't paint, okay, that's what right. I want to, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> right. Jason's got it. Yeah. <laughs> I got you. You just had to dummy it down for me. <laughs> That's okay. Me too. Me too. Right. There are a few examples where we did find that <clears throat> downtown overlay property on an alley would have a wall facing single family. Right. Um, so I that get concern that. was addressed. Any other questions or concerns? Just one question. I, I think I missed the meeting where this was discussed. Is there is there a, a, a board that reviews the... Yeah. Being yes. 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 Yes.
Yes, we like to keep them very much separate. Yeah. Um, we don't want to derail our momentum, but also we want to take care of what we've been directed to do. So, uh, are you ready for me? Please, sure, fine. dive right in. Okay, so uh, back at the last meeting on September 23rd, we discussed a bunch of stuff. MLCC rules, which we clarified, uh, were pretty simple. We discussed wind breaks. We also discussed the different zoning districts where outdoor dining is now, uh, just to look at uh, or start to look at what we might consider in terms of regulating outdoor dining in different districts. Um, so a lot of what came out of that meeting is was a desire for this body to study overhead weather protection, I've called it. Um, anything overhead, not enclosed, that protects uh, outdoor dining patrons from sun, rain, etc. So we discussed specific things at the meeting. Um, also, I brought up a couple of new things that I've at least seen in my studies of outdoor dining. And I went through them kind of uh, topic by topic. I first started with umbrellas, the easy one. Uh, we see a lot of umbrellas all the time, uh, all over the town already. I note that they are they're different sizes, shapes, materials, and we kind of have them all around here. Um, this board had also asked for um, some pricing estimates, uh, just to kind of get a catch our bearings in terms of what things cost. And umbrellas range a lot. There's the basic umbrellas. I've seen from 100 to 700 bucks um, with a base and your general coverage, but there are some really big, large, cantilevered style umbrellas that can cost upwards of $2,000. I've seen those being used. Uh, I live in Ferndale specifically at uh, One-Eyed Betty's in, in Ferndale. Mm -hmm. they, look, they, they look nice, but they are quite large. Um, so I did note some umbrella-specific problems that we may wish to address while we're doing this. The texture graphics issue, we do see a lot of umbrellas pop up with texture graphics around town. Sometimes they look like um, different liquors or different um, symbols. There are a couple of restaurants I can think of that have that. We don't think that's a good idea. Um, they'd be considered signage. We'd have to address it in the sign ordinance. It'd just be a slippery slope. In addition, uh, and along with what the building officials' comments were that we reviewed in study session number two, oftentimes these umbrellas can encroach into the airspace into that five foot clear path that we require currently, and oftentimes they're much lower than eight feet. So we consider that an obstruction in the what's supposed to be a required five foot clear path. So we, we thought that we could address that as well in the zoning ordinance. And then it came to canopies. There's uh, a few different types. There's a fixed awning slash canopy. Um, I reminded this board about what we did in the, with the projection to the right of way recently. Um, the standards we created for that. I noted. I, I looked up a couple of pictures. There are there are some outdoor dining patios that might fit under a canopy that um, also fits our projections into the right of way requirements. But um, once they get longer, we start talking land leases if it's on public property. If it's on private property, we don't have any regulations, so they can go quite far. Um, I also reached out to some awning companies that we work with often just to kind of get a ballpark price for those. Uh, I received those uh, that phone call late, so I don't have it in your report, but in general, for fixed awnings, they usually run about $28 a square foot. And of course, there's a million variables involved, but in general, as a general rule, $28 to $30 a square foot. So there's also freestanding awnings, canopies, tents, and pergolas. We discussed this a lot for a particular um, application we reviewed recently for Birmingham Roast. These are standalone. They require support posts for structure. We do see one on uh, the toast deck, which we just talked about. That was approved a couple of years ago. Um, there is currently no, really no ordinance language preventing people from applying for that. Now, of course, it still has to come to this board for approval for the most part. Um, but uh, again, if it's located on private property, we don't really necessarily ha have any rules against that either. Um, one of the big things we talked about last meeting was retractable awnings and how those could fit in to outdoor dining patios. Um, uh, we found there are two main types. There's ones that you can attach to a building. They roll into a cassette. I found that they can generally roll out uh, at a maximum without any supports about 8 to 10 feet. 
So that's a, that's a, a uh, usually about five feet more than what we permit with our projection into the right of way ordinance. Um, but there are also butterfly type awnings that extend out from a central set of posts. We see we have one over here at Bella Piatti. They've got a butterfly retractable awning, which was also approved. Um, the price for these also really range from uh, when you talk quality and size. I found some for about $500 that look pretty quality, and there are some upwards of $3,000. Um, the awning folks that I spoke with said that for retractable awnings, generally, they run about $25, uh, $25 a square foot. Um, moving on. Uh, one of the last ones we talked about, which was, it's kind of new. I don't, we don't see them in Birmingham for sure. I see them again because I live in Ferndale. I see a lot of Ferndale. I see them in Ferndale. Um, but shade sails or, or, or the sort of draped fabric um, installations for some shade or weather protection. They would still require generally some type of rigid support. They're, tension, they're, they're fixed with tension cables, so they need to be attached to some sort of post or some sort of fixed object, um, a building, for example. They're very customizable and uh, fairly cheap from what I saw. A single shade sail can range from about 50 to to $100 from what I see for about 100 square feet. And of course, that ranges with quality and size as well. I also wanted to run through really quick just a, a summary of the Joint Planning Board City Commission meeting on uh, well, October 11th. So we did talk about a lot of stuff. It kind of got, we kind of got in the weeds on a few things, but in general, it seemed like to me, and we can discuss this, that there was some support for outdoor dining into the colder months, which was important. That's something we, we've been approaching um, a, a decision on, so it seems like there's some support from the City Commission. Also, uh, it seemed like that, well, maybe it was more split than I let on, but it seemed like they didn't really feel it was necessary to regulate different types of businesses separately. And we could talk about that again. I just, um, that's what I gleaned from the meeting. Finally, uh, the concept of a trial period for new outdoor dining ordinances, it seemed like there was some support, but it was kind of unclear to me whether or not the city commission would support such a thing and um, if it would even work. And you, you heard that the city manager expressed some doubts with that based on enforcement and management of that trial period. He feels as though it could be burdensome for staff, but so we should still talk about that if that's something you're interested in. And um, Chairman Klein, if you don't mind, before I kick it back to you, I invited the fire chief, Paul Wells, yeah, here I tonight. I saw chief Wells. There was a lot of questions about fire suppression throughout our meetings. And I'm hoping that we can maybe invite him on first to answer all your fire suppression questions so that we can get him out of here. Great. Because um, he was gracious to come. So Great. if that's all right with you, I, um, he's on the Zoom. So I'd like to field any fire suppression related questions or fire code questions that you may have. And if he can help us answer them. Great. Well, welcome, Chief Wells. We appreciate you joining us. Um, Thanks for having me. Um, I'll, I'll throw it open to the board in, in a second. I guess the, the biggest one that I jumps to mind just comes into, you know, we don't want to suggest, recommend, or even push forward ideas to applicants that would uh, put them into categories that cause either violations of the fire code or requirements that we're unaware of, right? We don't want to cause fire suppression requirements if we don't need them, et cetera. Um, could, is there a way to tell us briefly, like do awnings off of all buildings of a certain size trigger this, this component, like other areas we should, we should be avoiding? So basically there's lots of codes. There's the fire code, obviously there's building codes, and then it, there's not one answer to meet all the needs. And going back to what was allowed before with um, the restrictions that we obviously we did look at each situation the best we can. We had lots and lots of violations. Uh, we had some close calls. So again, thank you for your time today. We want to make sure going forward we don't have any of that going on. Um, there are, they are outlined our most particular things in the two pages that are in Nick's report. But you know, if you have um, an awning attached or unattached, or if it's a temporary and it does exceed four feet, typically we need a sprinkler system. Um, a building that already has a suppression system and you add on to it, 
you know, closer than roughly three feet. That's kind of what we came up with because there is some in between the lines. You're now kind of at, you're at and out of that building and the building, if it was, if it was, if it was designed because it's a newer construction with sprinklers, you need to continue that. You can't um, have this accessory. So we did have some places that uh, over the last winter that we're going to need to add if they continue. I know there's some places in town that want to add permanent outdoor awnings or enclosures and those are newer that are attached to newer buildings again those would need to be added to sprinkler systems um, it's not as expensive in every case as you might think just to add to that to keep with the codes there is no end all we try to put our best thing out there one of the things nick and i talked about is i saw you were looking at the triangular shades um, again if it's a cable three feet away from the building a steel cable then you have these shade things that would be okay because there's this gap between the buildings so it's not really all one question the nice thing is is all these do go through by uh, the fire marshal um, and the building department to make sure we can work through that before something gets to you guys to be approved so we obviously we, we never want anything built or paid for and then come back and say sorry you can't do that we want to do the catch it early on and, and work with it the biggest thing is, is when you take an enclosure, an outside thing, um, and you can close it, it's really not outside dining anymore, it's enclosed. And if you start having propane heat in there um, versus something safer like electric heat that's designed to be closer to flammable materials uh, or combustible materials, that's the safest way. Propane can be very, very dangerous. Um, we did that propane exchange, for instance, the fire department. Last winter, we exchanged about 1,500 bottles for the restaurants, and multiple times you would walk back to our cage and smell propane because those bottles get beat up. People turn them in after 10 years or just sit in your garage, and that's where the danger is with propane. It, it, sinks, it sinks to lowest space, so that's kind of an, you know something we would want to stay away from as much as possible when you're starting closing things. You can also have a production of oxygen, that, um, which we again had a case of that last winter. We caught it, thankfully, early on because you're just pumping all this heat out there and the building's not designed for it. So I guess those are the things I really see the most be an issue. We're definitely not against it. We're trying to keep everyone safe. All these codes are made because of unfortunately accidents you know across the world and they put them together and try to make the safest outcome the biggest question that comes up a lot is well i've seen this in this city how come you guys are being more strict <laughs> uh, we're, we're more strict we just we have the staffing we have the people our fire marshal is very educated on this and he's just we just try to follow the rules because ultimately the responsibility comes on right. myself and the city if we don't enforce the rules so we're trying to work with you any way we can and that's what i'm here for uh, any questions at all? Great. Well, just to summarize, just to make sure I heard what you said. If, if um, an awning or any sort of the like is attached to or within three feet of the building, that's where we start to get into issues of suppression and is what I'm hearing. But if you're on a parking deck, let's say you've got a deck out in a parking space and you're open air, but you have a permanent canopy, that's not the same thing. Is that is that how I heard? That, that's correct. If okay. you're a detached from the building, then you would not need suppression. Okay. In, okay. In, in, most, in that case. Perfect. If Thank it's you. a small thing. I mean, if you start going 5,000 square feet, it's right, a sure. permanent structure, or you start going over 100 people, and it's a permanent structure, well, of it's, course. it's a building. It's not of course. Uh, more of a temporary thing yeah. or, you know, seasonal we'll thing. Here first, it's about something he's thought, though. We'll, we'll, we'll go here first. Mr. Williams? Yeah, I, Chief Could, uh, I think there isn't any support on the planning board or for what I heard on the city commission for total enclosures going right. forward. So right. um, I, I think that's not going to be an issue. But can you talk about what I call a combination of uh, overhead protection and wind breaks on the side? Um, I mean, how do you define enclosure, and and how does the how how are you going to go forward in defining enclosure? Because I think there is some support for a combination of overhead protection and wind breaks, not uh, literally floor to ceiling, but some wind breaks maybe up to what was your height? 60, 60, 60 inches. 60 inches. So can you comment on that? 
Sure. So again, if it's like the fire code, I'm, I'm not an expert. It's hundreds of pages, and again, you have to look at right. everything, and then we, should, we update every few years. The main thing is that, like, look at the canopies. If a canopy hat is over that four feet mark, you know, on day one of building a new building, you have to have it suppressed. So if it's attached from the building four feet out, and that's because of fire spread going up, cracking windows, getting inside, you know, we start to burn things inside. So that's the biggest no-no we can't do is have it attached to the building past the four foot mark. That's where you have to have that gap. And, um, now, wind breaks, no problem. It's really, it's the overhang, because the overhang catches the hot gases, catches the, the flames, and then has a flame spread from there. That's where the biggest part of preventing it is. If you just had a wind break outside of a, of a suppressed building, but there's nothing overhanging you know, above you at all to keep that flame spread from spreading side to side, we would not have any problems as long as egress was being fouled, like, like you've already talked about earlier, the meeting of the five foot walkways, getting to the fire department connection that's hooking up to the sprinkler system, the wind break from the fire department would not be an issue. It's once you won't put an overhang. Okay. You know, that, that's where we have to look at the code and look at each case. Okay. Thank you. So I guess if I could follow that's up on that, because I'm now I'm not clear. You know, if we're, if you have one of these outdoor dining platforms, it's in the street. So by definition, you're more than five feet from the building. And if you've got three sides that have 42 inch barrier of some kind to keep the cars from driving in, and maybe either you do or you don't have another uh, 18 inches of some clear windbreak material. If then, but if on top of that, there is either umbrellas that more or less cover the majority or there's one of these sailcloths that are set up that that do cover a majority of the, you know, of the, uh, can't call it a ceiling, but what would otherwise be open air. Does, does, is that allowable under the fire code? Does that require no. sprinkling? That, that's no, what... You, said, you did say to detach from the building. Not De detached, yeah. Price, right? yeah. Right, correct. Yeah, if it's correct. If it's not attached to the building and it's independent of the building, far enough away, and then you can, there's no suppression. We're not going to have anyone run water okay. pipes out to that. All right, thank you. To it. That's not, yeah, oh, still don't just, the just the other stuff we look at. Yeah, all right, thanks. Janelle, you had a question? Yeah, uh, I'm just a little unclear still on, on the, the part of being attached to the building, Chief. Um, any awning attached to the building? You, you made a mention of four feet. I don't know what that four foot number was. If any awning attached well, to the building is has to be suppressed? If you, have, if you have a new, if it's a new building that's attached, I'd have to look back at the grandfathering if it's an older building and all of a sudden you added a five foot awning. But in general, the fire code, you're, since you're adding the awning after the fact, no matter what the fire code says, it means to be anything four foot out past the building has to be suppressed. So if they put a three so, foot, 10 inch awning, for example, that would not have to be suppressed? Correct, at this time, that would not have to be suppressed in okay. the fire code. That's Again, the fire code, we're in 2015, and the state, the fire, it's hooked to our ordinance with the billing code, and it might go to, to the 2021, which has not been completed in the next year, and that could change, because that, again, things change. So even if something's done locally, we still, um, go with the latest fire code. Go on. Okay. So Mr. Co Mr. Cozy. Is, is that only if it's combustible? Yeah. If you have a, a metal awning it's that, all, that it's non combustible like metal, then that could be different. Then you wouldn't have to suppress it. That means that means no decorations. We have, again we have to look at each plan because you have to see, you know, right. some people's it, it could be a not combustible rain, but it's not high enough for our standards. But but again, like steel, if it's all steel, that would be allowed. Um, right. So if the for, building's already not suppressed. Right. So for descriptive and, and again, reason, if you're not enclosing it too, because once you start enclosing it, it changes too. We have to look at everything. Right. But but if I have a thousand square foot building and it's new construction, and let's say it's an office building, so the the code does not dictate that that needs to have a fire. And let's say you have access on four sides and. And it's built out of non you know, you, you're not obligated to fire suppress that building. So that's correct. That's smaller. I believe that's under the, I think it starts at 5,000. Right. And so again, too, 
we, you know, we have we have um, restaurants that are looking to expand in our city that are talking about, and I, you know, that's, I don't want to call it a strip mall, but a larger building where they have different tenant space and they're looking to expand. And when that happens and they now change their occupancy over 100 people, and that include, you know, that's your guests, your wait staff, everyone. In those cases, too, they even have to go back and retrofit the building to have sprinklers because that's what the code requires. There's a lot, of, a lot of factors. Right. So it's it's the combustible material and the enclosure thereof that triggers this, not the fact that it's an awning that extends Fair out point. three foot one inch okay. or something. Right. And then there's assemblies to look at too. Like I said, there's so there's some buildings that had additions over the winter, like last winter that were getting over. We did some head counts and they were notified that they were going to have to suppress the whole building if. The commission and the planning department allowed that structure to stay you know, up against the building then the whole building would have to be suppressed because now it's changed that structure's occupancy and okay. that's counted as square footage so. okay. Okay. mr board uh, slightly different question but seeing you're here it'd be helpful um what <coughs> are there any rules about using the pro propane canisters on a deck whether it's got a cover or not are there any numerical um, constraints that we need to know about as we go forward? So we have allowed the um, heating elements, if they're on a deck in a, in a container that's, in, you know, um, that's not enclosed, we have allowed it. Again, over the winter, lots of people went out and bought heaters, and we had to write a lot, you know, gave a lot of notices, and then, then you know, someone would remove them, then someone else would come on, different shift, different wait staff, and add them. But there is, you need to make sure there's proper clearances. That's why we put in the report, our electric's the safest. Um, for instance, there's some people that wanna have open um, fireplaces lately we've seen of the outdoor time. Mm -hmm. Those those cannot be, you know, uh, put on a um, deck, um, you know, with the, you know, with even the screen cover because the decks are combustible. So we have to look at each case, but you know, we have had heaters that were used properly allowed. Okay, and thank you. Them, we'll even look at the manufacturer because there's so many things being made. We'll look at what UL laboratories rated it as, what's a, what's a minimum clearance, and then that's where we can look at the fire code and say, well, the fire code might say five feet, but this has been tested. It's a reliable product. We can maybe go three feet. So there is some of that leeway. But again, that, that's why we ask when they, an applicant puts everything in, we can see what, what they're going to use as a heating source. Thank you. Great. Any last oh. Well, we'll go Stuart and then Janelle, then we'll finish up. Um, just one more little thing on this combustible thing. Sure. Are there, other than metal, to your to your knowledge, are there fabrics that are non-combustible, like whatever they make kids' pajamas out of or anything? You know? Again, everything, especially when you degrade it to the sun, is not something we, we tend to allow at that point. You know, if we had a trellis that was made of a non-combustible, um, Material and spaced out a certain amount, and there was, and we made sure there was going to be no fabric hanging or you know, dressing up. And that is something I think we have allowed in the past, you know. But again, typically no, unless it's for sure like a metal, then we are we don't allow it. That's again we have to look at every situation. We, I apologize. I you know when it comes to the medical side of things, our side of things, it's so plain as easy how our protocols are. But when it comes to this, it's just there's so much to look through and then. We work with the building the department, which just try to do what's we always err on the side of caution and then we try to do as best as we can with consistency. There are three places I can speak of in town that have, you know, the outdoor enclosures like Social, Market North, Papa Joe's, where they can open up the sides. Those are all suppressed yep. because in the original plans, it was okay, this is what we want to do. We want to have this, these membranes, we're going to zip down these windows. Open us up to have and those nice on those nice days. Those buildings are all suppressed. So, and they're and they're tucked away. And you never would know it. But they're there. So, again, with this possible expansion <laughs> changing, we're trying to keep with consistency and and do the best we can to keep it safe and the same. Okay. Ms. Boyce. Uh, just one more thing. When you first started um, talking tonight, you mentioned that shade sails that are attached to a building with a cable. And extend over the dining. If the, the fabric component of those shade sails is greater than three feet from the building, then that would not require fire suppression. Is that 
correct that you said uh, that? Correct. I spoke to I spoke to the fire marshal today to go over that because the fire code attached to the building, you know, it, it's vague. So that's where we have our our leeway and looking at the buildings in town here that have done things that you know where the city sidewalks are. We feel comfortable that if you had trade sales and you hooked them with a metal cable to the building and you had that gap, we would be comfortable with that and it would not be something that would have to be suppressed. Great. Any other questions, the chief? Chief Wells, thanks a lot. If there's anything that pops up, I'm, I'm, I'm just, if I'm here to help out. That's great. Well, hey, listen, no apologies. We really appreciate your help on this. Thank you so much. No problem. All right. Take care. Thank you. Um, that was helpful. That was extremely helpful. That was great. Yeah. Extremely helpful. Uh, Nick, was there anything else you wanted to wrap up before we dive right in? Have at it. All right. Well, board, I think, well, Nick, you included some, um, I believe, it's starting on page... Is it 114 of the 115? Is that that's some proposed ordinance language as it stands now, at least? Yeah, I'd Draft. just be kind of tweaking it here and yeah. there based on your comments. Just, just to get us going, right? Just those okay. spaghetti at the wall. Exactly. Perfect. Well, I appreciate the report. It's well done. I appreciate the chief being here. Um, board, I'd like to get into a conversation. I I, I, I hate to, to maybe direct it a little too much, but I guess thinking about this, having read the report and and the like, I think we're a little closer than maybe we had given ourselves credit. And I want to suggest that maybe there are just a few fundamental questions we need to start answering, uh, discussing and answering, um, to help guide us through finalizing the, you know, a, a better draft of this thing. Um, and maybe I'll just start doing that if you guys are okay with it. You know, I, number one, do we want to allow outdoor dining all year long without an additional permit, essentially eliminating the the, the, the date restrictions in the ordinance. Yes. I think that's pretty clear that everybody has said yes. Is that about right? Are you referencing a specific? No, I'm just referencing okay. uh, my own. Uh, okay. So repeat it again. That I think it's pretty clear that the commission, the public, and most of us have said that we would uh, want to eliminate the date requirement for outdoor dining and allow anyone that has approval to do it to do it throughout the year if they choose to. Right. I guess the question would be, um, Currently, platforms are required to come in. By eliminating that date requirement, are we okay with platforms staying out all winter? Yeah, I, I think, and I, I try to go through all the places in my head, because I wouldn't want to, like, totally screw over somebody. But I think when you have the numbers, no, I mean, let's think November 15th to through into March, you're not going to have the, the numbers that you're going to have in the other months. And so I think in most cases that I can think of, I couldn't think of anybody totally penalized. Everybody would be able to have some, maybe not as much. But um, to me, to, to clean up the streets, to Robin's point, to have this, these things sit so empty so long okay. and to take up spots um, and then, you know, with the slush and stuff getting caught, I, I think... I, I'd rather hand, I'd say no, and then handle it on a variance basis where somebody can show, hey, the way my building's situated or something, this is the all I got kind of thing. The Board of Zoning Appeals just had a heart attack, but no. <laughs> what, what, um, what, what, just a devil's advocate, what if an applicant doesn't have space on their sidewalk? I mean, essentially, let's look at toast. You know, if they, if they have 10 seats along their building and they've got, I don't know, 30 seats in their deck, we're saying no deck. Um, what if we told them they had to choose deck or side? Well, I guess I'm, I'm just asking out loud. I mean, well, I, I would, yeah, I would just, I mean, I, I think it allows you a lot of things too. One is, is you're, you're the building, then you, then you have a better opportunity to have the heat stuff, you know, electric on a building or, or whatever. Uh, you're not doing the portable stuff that can cause problems too. I don't know. I, um, Fair. it could be a variance. It could be something maybe that who, you know, us or city commission have approval to, have a little bit of leeway if somebody shows us a hardship, but. Okay. Do you know? I'm inclined to agree with Stuart and a lot for Robin's point initially. I, I would hate to see um, platforms in the street um, just empty January, February, March. Um, I, I could see them being used through December. Um, the weather doesn't seem to get as bad as it is in, right. after the first of the year, but. Um, you know, I just hate to see a bunch of empty, dark platforms with furniture storage on them for three months in the winter. So, 
unless there were some rules that required they be activated, which I don't know how we could exactly do that, but it's my opinion on your question. Sure. And I, I'm of that opinion that, um, that we should encourage those who are able to seat people adjacent to their building or on private property, but, but not to continue the use of or the, the placement of the outdoor decks on the, in, in the parking spaces during the winter months. Ms. Kozik. When you use the term platform, you know, how, do you, how, do you, how do you define that? So the, the ones that I've seen, I think were always intended to be temporary. You put them up in the weekend, you take them down in the weekend, and they're done, they're gone. You know, curb and gutters are designed for snow plows and drainage, and you scrape against it. And so if we have these sort of things sort of sprinkled throughout, like the one up in front of Dick O'Dow's, you know, I, I, I guess I haven't thought about it, but I guess I'm concerned that, that you know, you nick that thing or you plow two feet of snow on it, and, you know, they, I don't think they were designed to last for decades. Nick? I just want to throw out there, because um, I didn't hear it mentioned, not that no one's thought of it. So there's one thing I thought of that we could, when writing this ordinance, maybe it required decks to be a little slimmer, so that there's not that slow plow, snow plow, well, collision problem. Two, we don't have to allow decks year round, but we could let them go a little longer, as Janelle suggested. The data that I've seen since 2015, it really only snows with any considerable amount in January and February. Could we let them have it November, December? Maybe, something to consider. Um, oh, and then there was one more comment. Oh, to Bert's point about <coughs> decks, there are at least two examples that I can think of that are actually decks in the sidewalk. The Mori and um, the Rugby Grill. So we'd have to make some sort of distinction, sure. whether it be decks in the street or decks in general. Sure. That could be, that could be done. So you're good on your first statement. Yeah, I'm actually, no, it's, this, is, this is what, these are the questions I think we need and, to, discussion we need to have. Can I ask a question? I mean, we have a civil engineer and we have another civil engineer. Like, like, what are your thought when they put up the decks now, is somebody looking at water flow and drainage and what if it blocks the catch basin? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're supposed to be designed where, to allow flow through the, through the curb. I mean, that's not perfect. Don't get me wrong. But they are designed to, to do that. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm I think this is exactly the kind of conversation we need to have. I'm a little surprised, but uh, th th that's fine. Um, I don't know that I have an issue with them being out outside of them being dark. I mean, that's the one that I struggle with. Because you're right, a bunch of empty decks all winter long makes you feel like maybe you're in a ghost town that the buildings aren't open. I get that. I also know that as we hear the city commission, as we read all of the, the Engage Birmingham <coughs> resident comments, as we hear from business owners that own restaurants, they want these in the winter. And I don't know that delivering enhanced dining for two more months or um, you know, allowing the decks for two more months, which again is just rather arbitrary. We picked it. Why? Well, because. Um, or telling them they can't have them and we've got to only have it against buildings and some people can't have it on sidewalks because there's not enough room. I don't know if that's necessarily what the commission and maybe the, the residents have asked us to look at doing. Again, we have to do what's right. I'm not uh, implying we just do what they want, but I'm, I'm, I'm torn by that fact. But, uh, another, another yeah. So what percentage of, of current outdoor dining, or, or say pre-COVID, was within the streetscape versus a deck that was built out into the parking zone. Is it half and half? If you give me a second, I can kind of count based on a map I made, but I don't know the number off the top. Of okay. It's a good question. While he's doing that, Mr. Because of the reason I'm asking is I think I'd be less concerned about if it's within the right. sidewalk, of course, with the five foot clearance. Yeah. No, fair point. Very fair point. Mr. Williams. Yeah. I mean, the one caveat I have on, on the, <clears throat> what we've heard today on uh, having the four-foot clearance is in some situations, um, 
I think we're almost forcing restaurants to go to the deck if they want to have winter protection. Um, particularly where there's not a lot of um, passageway immediately adjacent to the building and the sidewalk. I'm thinking uh, Lux, Salvatore. I mean, there's not enough room there if they have to have the covering attached but three feet from the building. There's just not enough room, which means we're going to force them out into the street. I know, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know, but we're going to lose even more parking spaces if we do. Um, and I, and I, I just think it's... Uh, if we allow them year round, uh, we're going to see more of them. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. And I think we better figure out if that's what the city wants. So I think that's fundamentally the question. Do we want this? You know, and Sorry, but Brian, could, could you clarify what you just said there? Yeah, I think if, if, if what we're saying is you can have a deck out on the street year round, which you can't now. I think we're going to see more restaurants want to put decks out in the street. Okay, sorry. I, 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 that's and what I, 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 I In fact, I can't think of anybody that wouldn't want that because it may be the only way that they can have outdoor dining with sufficient protection because suppression is not an issue, we just heard. Now, I'm not saying no, but I'm saying that changes... Um, in one sense, it may be good. So let me just deal with one example. One of the complaints, I think, about, and I hate to pick on them, but the Lux type arrangement is you felt like you were in the middle of the restaurant when you were walking in the sidewalk, right? Great. Because there was dining on both sides. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't feel that way if they had a deck. Right. So... I guess what I'm saying is I think if we go this route and we permit decks year-round, we're going to see a lot of them. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing because effectively we're telling people go put the deck out there and take up some parking spaces and you're going to have better protection from the elements because of all we heard from the fire chief. I just want to make a comment. I don't know that's whether something needs to be fire suppressed or not should figure into good urban planning. There, there may be systems, and I thought the chief sort of alluded to, it, it may not mean now you're tapping into the main building system and you're piercing walls, and there may be some, like a fire extinguisher that you hang up there and it has. So I don't know the answer to that, yeah. but I don't think that should dictate. Hey, Bert, I, I spoke to one of the restaurant owners that has suppression and had a retro it for theirs that were mentioned earlier tonight. And he said, point blank, he goes, it really wasn't that expensive. Okay. He didn't tell me the exact number, but he said it's, 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 it's not a big deal. He said it seemed like a big deal, but it really wasn't cost-wise. Mr. Sherry, you first. So a couple of points. One is that I don't know that we ought to be worried about allowing every single, or I didn't say allowing, but crafting an ordinance to enable every single restaurant to have you know, enhanced or outdoor dining all year round. If you happen to be on a sidewalk, if your space between your building and the sidewalk is six feet, well, you've got a condition that I don't think it's our responsibility to deal with. I think our responsibility is to make sure that there's adequate clearance um, and if that's five feet, great. If it's six feet, great. Whatever it is, we we conclude. Secondly, I'm I'm thinking that not having or not allowing decks, whether it's December 15th or January 1st through March, it isn't a big deal to me. But not allowing them in the snowy part of the year makes a lot of sense. I think they won't be used very often. I think that if you do the cost-benefit analysis in terms of the deck standing up to the snow removal and the snow plows and the amount that they're used, it just doesn't, you know, it just doesn't work out. It, and along the lines of, you know, sort of a modified trial or temporary, if, if it turns out that a um, 
feckless in the street program is unsatisfactory to the vast majority of the town, both the restaurateurs and the citizens, we can, you know, correct that in a subsequent year. Ms. Boyce? Um, I, Brian's point uh, made me think of something else because I, I think you may have something there. If we give everyone a deck in the street all year round, who wouldn't want one? Um, it's it's extra extra tables and extra people and more money. So my question is, what about bathroom facilities when we increase these numbers? I know we've talked about it in the past, but do you have some real numbers for us, like to understand if um, well, you know this is? Well, I actually works? believe that that Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson, the building official, indicated that they they were now counting outdoor seating toward the assembly of the restaurant and therefore into bathroom requirements, uh, sprinkler requirements, and any other code requirements. I, am I the only one that heard that? Well, that's what he said. So, I mean, so, I think that's already somewhat taken into account and perhaps our zoning ordinance needs to take a look at it from a parking perspective, depending on where it is in the city, unfortunately. But um, th I think yeah, the building okay. officials already got it from that code issues. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a number, but that is true. Okay. Mr. What? I just want to clarify, and, and, and I may have m made myself not clear. I think we should clearly state that outdoor dining should be allowed 20, uh, tw tw 12 months a year, period, for our mm -hmm. dining facility, cafes, etc. It is about our policy of bringing the public out into the street and activating our street. That's sort of one principle. But the second point I, I was trying to make, and maybe it was misheard, was I, I don't think we necessarily need to approve all forms of outdoor dining. And one of these would be to contain or, or restrict the time that which you're allowed to have a deck which is out in the right of way. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think the practical answer of following that suggestion is that People that don't have a deck and have outdoor dining year-round and they've really only effectively used it, let's say, nine months of the year, sure. they're not going to construct a deck if they can't use it. In those, if we're not going to be able to use it from January to March, I'm not going to build a deck right. because I don't need a deck for the other nine months. So I, I, I don't think there'll be a big change there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I was concerned about. If if we're going year round and we're going to let the decks out there year round, we're going to have a whole new ball game. See, I don't know if I, I I totally agree with that because there are still only certain types of, of businesses that can get outdoor dining. We certainly can write an ordinance. We haven't talked about it yet tonight. We brought it up. You you mentioned it even about the again I'm not picking on them, but the feeling like you're walking through the restaurant. We saw it here today in the photo that I talked about. We haven't talked about that yet. Um, I don't know that we're going to see some mad rush. I mean, we, we are in control, uh, and we, I mean the city, is in, the, is in control of who is allowed to obtain outdoor dining, right? And, and you know, part, part of, I don't know if it was the APC or whether it was uh, master plan conversations, et cetera, there was a discussion of maybe looking at ma um, maximum number of decks within districts. And I know that's beyond our question tonight. I am a little surprised just because I, I think that if we roll out a revised ordinance that says you are allowed to have outdoor dining 12 months a year, and not only are you allowed, but we encourage it, mm -hmm. but you can't have outdoor dining on a platform that you already have approval for, and you must take that down, I don't think we're going to see outdoor dining in order. I'm sorry. You I don't think we're going to see continued yeah. outdoor dining in our city during I, the winter. I completely disagree. No. I completely Honestly, disagree. Honestly, don't have the, the facility to do it. State. No, okay. you won't have it everywhere. You won't have it everywhere. But That's you'll okay. have it. You'll have it many places. You'll have it at the places I think it really works well, though. Right. You'll have it at two or three places that have a competitive advantage. And, and, and again, it's not my business to, to tell a restaurant what they should or shouldn't do, but. I clearly, and, and maybe the, maybe I'm mistaken, I clearly got that the city commission wanted to encourage to maintain the level of outdoor dining we've seen over the last few years through ordinance revisions. Not to...
kind of allow it and then just make sure it's up against the building. And, right. and maybe I'm reading into that. And again, again, just one of seven here that are going to have to vote on this. But I, I'm, I'm a little concerned we're getting off of where I think the commission was leading us and where I think the public is at least uh, clamoring for. Well, the for point what I was going to make a minute ago was that, you know, if, if I, I, I agree with Brian, I, I, it's a slippery slope, and I think you're going to have a lot jump on. And to Dan's point, um, yeah, they'll, um, uh, well, kind of like Dan's point, uh, the investment, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather put an ordinance out there and say, hey, guess what? We need to go further than to have have to claw it back after some everybody's invested in these decks and and you know and then the city you know we find out oh guess what we got liability on decks because the plow hit it and now we have to pay for the guy's deck and <laughs> yeah yeah I mean I'd rather I'd rather give them seventy five percent this time and then say okay we heard you and we're going to go with the next twenty five percent but I, I I think I think we're still really in the spirit I'm I'm going through the places that I would eat out. In the winter, it's not about you. <laughs> well, no, no, I just no, but I, 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 you know, I look at a cafe via. It's going to work great for them. It's uh, Dick O'Dowd's is going to work great for them. Toast has got heaters in there. They won't have as many, but they'll have what they, you know, had at the very beginning. Ely uh, Street Side. What are they going to do? Um, What's the Townhouse going to do? Yeah, they'll have some in the front. Well. No, well, townhouse it's not would be, our job yeah. to solve everyone's problems. I get right, that. Right, right. Well, no, I, yeah. Town, townhouse would be. Townhouse might be one that says, "Hey, listen, we're we're kind of formulated on this," but I don't know. Um, no, no, the there there, there will be some. Winter, we're out all last winter, weren't they? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, did, did, did we hit any decks? Some guys. Did our snow plows hit any decks that we're aware of? They weren't all out. I don't think they were all out. There's a. Huh? No, some of the some of the decks got pulled in. No. Uh, I think another important part of this is uh, changing the rules about requ if, if I'm in favor of allowing outdoor dining all year round. I do think the deck should come in for at least January and February. Um, but I think all year round that uh, the restaurant should be allowed to leave their furniture outside um, and not have the burden. I think we'll see more use outside in the winter months if they're not burdened with having to take them in and out every single night. So I'd like to have something that would require how they have to keep maintain the snow around their furniture, um, you know, so that so that that isn't an, uh, an obstacle for um, our guys having to clean the sidewalks and whatnot. But. Um, I think we really need to allow them to be able to keep that stuff outside in the winter um, rather than take it in. Okay. So, Nick, I'm hearing, just as far as moving forward with the draft here, I'm hearing uh, allowing it year-round, but I'm hearing not allowing decks any further than, I mean, I guess there's some debate about whether we want to change the months, but not allowing them in the winter, essentially, whatever we define that as. I don't think I agree with that. I don't think I do too, but I hear five others that do. And uh, you oh. know, for the sake of moving the draft forward to next week, you know, or the next time we meet, I think we at least need to start. But if you have a situation where you say, "Well, you can have outdoor dining year-round, but the only practical way you can have it is on a deck," but you got to take the deck in, you just said, "Okay, you can't have outdoor dining." Unless we require that they have it activated, oh, no, which yeah. I don't know how you can do. I mean, keep, keep in mind we're talking January, February. There's just not going to be a huge bunch of people on a bunch of days doing this well you got to change the dates then. yeah yeah change the date oh yeah change the dates yeah well oh you pinch it you pinch it down. <laughs> that's part of it we want it well, we, we want them when they're there to be used not just stored out there that's for the months the of point. january february and march yeah, rather right. than taking them down absolutely we don't want the street to be a storage spot for the decks i i agree with that agree with but, that but i so let's change the dates yeah i'm in favor Listen, we need to continue to, to, to craft this. I'm going to suggest that, you know, we're not done. But for our next meeting, maybe we come back and the, your draft ordinance says that they have to, uh, the decks are not allowed past, you know, that I've heard January for, for Well, I think clearly people. we ought to extend it another month. I don't right. see any reason why we wouldn't go to December 15th, maybe even December How about we just say January 1st? Yeah. yeah. Through the holidays. And, and we'll revisit this next meeting. I mean, I think we all need to think I, about this. and. I think we go to study. year end, period. So what about um, um, and well, wait just to, to finish the thought and with the provision that anything that's outdoors they can leave they can leave they don't have to keep bringing it in every night 
And that's a good go. clarification because I did have in my draft that they needed to bring it in. That was just a message so to the old. Mm -hmm. That's our draft moving forward. From Happy now. to try yeah. it. Happy to try and it. And then the decks are out for three months. Mm -hmm. As of right now, yes. Well, March, yeah, March is kind of a strange month anyway. You know, we could say March 15th. No, that's fine. Sure. Mr. Boyle. No, I just wanted to move. Seeing we've got our, we're, we're into a debate here. I think we, we do need to address the question of overhead. Yes. What was the acronym you came up with, Nick? OWP. 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 I, I, I really think that's OWP, whichever. <laughs> that's, to me, that's a, the, the, perhaps the most important thing we can discuss. Yep. Um, so let me throw it out. I, I am absolutely in favour of having some measure of overhead weather protection, providing it is in the form of a removable umbrella. Let me throw that out. Okay. So, in some shape or form, because I know from personal personal experience, I cannot move my umbrella in my uh, on my patio. I just can't. Mm -hmm. It weighs two hundred and fifty pounds. So, if we go down a, a route that allows large umbrellas, that you, you cannot move them. They are they are fixed, effectively fixed, by uh, sand or some other weight that keeps the, the, the umbrella. So my, my concern is, is, is having something that is flexible. I want coverage. I want people to be able to sit out there in an evening, maybe even 12 months of a year, but I'd like to have them in a, in, in, in not, not under an awning, not under a, 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 a hut. I think okay. she doesn't agree with you. No, probably not. Anyway, I'm just throwing it out. I'm, I'm, it's there for discussion. Okay, so let me just under, make sure we're, we're clear. We're not talking about anything with sides. This is still all open air. Yes. Overhead protection. You're yes. talking about m movable umbrellas is Correct. what you want. That's the term I, think I came okay. up with. I just came up with it to, to get the debate going. These don't comply. The two images up there in your mind. They do not apply. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. No, I didn't get Oh, no, no, all go down would. further. No, he's saying all of these wouldn't. I think nope. none of these would comply. No, nope. so just and even those. Show you oh, what wow. no. say. Okay, the shades. Well, I don't think we well, got some that, 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 that already are approved. Just this. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that's the start. Let, let's talk through this. Hey, okay, okay. So I'll be I'll be a counterpoint on this. Yeah, to me, the best coverage. It looks the nicest. It it gives you the maximum. It gives you good protection, but you still get can look is the one at Toast. I think it's clean and it's, it's, it looks durable. It doesn't look beat up after a year. Um, okay. So in me, I would like to see, I, if, if, you know, if this was a board of one, my vote would be, I'd have that kind of mechanism on a, on a standalone deck and I'd have the black awnings, the retractable awnings uh, for the stuff that extends from the, uh, from the building. And neither one can encroach into the five feet. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, 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 I don't have any problem with retractable awnings as opposed to umbrellas. Um, as long, and I, and I think the important thing here is no coverage over the five foot clearance area. Correct. That's sort of principle one. Or out into the street. Yeah. Well, from the building out into the street. Yeah, yeah. I mean, out into the. Mm -hmm. So that what you're seeing in the picture now is I think what Stuart is referencing. Uh, we'll go Janelle first. Um, okay, a couple things. Um, a counter to Robin as well. I'm more in favor of too heavy of pieces that can't be moved by people because I don't trust where they put them. So I like the idea that they're fixed and stuck in place and they don't have the option of dragging them around because the sun gets in their way over here, so they pull it out here. And so that's the reason I like the heavier stuff. Um, it doesn't give as much flexibility. I made a good, bad, and ugly list of these pictures. <laughs> and <laughs> I think umbrellas are good. And, and I like the freestanding awnings, like Stuart showed, just, just described at Toast. Um, the butterfly awnings I like. I like the sage shade sails. Um, I especially like the cost of those and how they can be attached and 
and not be part of it, which I know we're not supposed to figure, but get used. that pleased me. Um, one thing that I don't think we could probably use is a retractable awning mounted to a building now, given what we learned tonight. Right. right. Can't so do that it. one's out. Right. Well, um, unless it's, no, no, it's not. Unless it's under three feet, not, three foot, 11 inches. No, it's or, or the, you know, permanent, and you just you use fire suppressors. The one guy said he would pay for it, wasn't yeah. it, right? But how do you suppress a retractable awning? Put, in a, uh, Put a, a sprinkler, sprinkler underneath the ca uh, cassette. Let them figure it out. Yeah. Let them figure yeah. it out. I'm sure it's the whole of Arizona okay. has water in these awnings. Yeah. Yeah. The whole of Arizona. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't deep. know. Um, one other thing I don't like about the retractable awnings is the housing component. Um, they're pretty darn big. Um, I was trying to get some specs online uh, today, and I couldn't get anything as good as I maybe li would like to have, but it appears that they're at least a minimum of a 12 inch by 12 inch cassette that's mounted up there. So just something to think about. Um, it'd be nice to know how big they really are. And I imagine they only get bigger as the awnings get bigger. Um, can, can we talk about wind breaks? Well, not quite, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we're, getting there. we're getting there yet. We're getting there, we're getting there. Um, I think that that one picture of the red awning you had in there that was mounted to the building that was very low and almost touching the head of the patrons, I think that's atrocious. I would not like to see that. Okay, okay I'm done okay. with my list of awnings. Mr. Chair? So I think first, I, this is a question for the group. I, I don't think we were looking at changing the ordinance with regard to how far out awnings can go. We've already got an ordinance that says, I think it's the lesser of five feet or... Mm -hmm you know, some percentage, a third or something like that of the, the distance. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm moving forward with the thought that we're not changing that limit, right? That being the case, then I think the issue for me becomes, um, I, I tend to agree that movable things are a problem that they'll end up in the middle of a five-foot clear sidewalk. So the problem for me is making sure that there's no coverage in the five-foot clear area you know, up to the sky, so right. to speak, to the moon or whatever, um, and probably some kind of minimum height of these, you know, if it's a self-contained awning structure like you just showed for toast, that there's some minimum height. And I don't, I don't profess to know whether that's seven feet, eight feet, nine feet, but something, because to me it's important to have the visual and the, the clearness and the <laughs> sense of... Well, if the NBA oh, comes to rugby girl, they're going to have it higher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, um, just, yeah, Mr. Jeff, off of Mr. Shear's point, the one, the one thing that's changed, though, is when we had the five feet or yeah. whatever thing, we're now making sidewalks that are 18 feet deep. No. So, I mean, you put five feet at Birmingham Rose, it looks kind of stupid because it's a, like, you know, 18, 20 foot deep. Thing. So you, you know, I think if we maybe regulate it more on how much open area do you need to have minimum or, 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 or do, you know, maybe it's the greater of two things if as long as you manage the five feet. But I mean, I think five feet and some of the new stuff we're doing with the street. And, and so out front of Phoenicia is, it could be an 18 foot thing and with a five foot awning. And then what do you do for all those other tables? It'd be nice to have one consistent yeah. thing. All right. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good yeah, that is a good point. A couple of things. I would agree that I don't like the retractable, mm -hmm. just from an aesthetic perspective. Um, I like umbrellas, personally. I think that's my aesthetic choice, though I get that some of these other ones. I don't have a problem with the, the, the draped uh, shade or some of the other ones, as long as they're tastefully done. Um, I think the thing that, that concerns me is just making sure we're not pinning people into corners here. And what I mean by that is, if we're saying people can't have decks at certain times and all of the dining is going to be against the building, if we're even saying that that's the preferred location at some point, and maybe that's kind of what the intent of the Beaster Ordinance really was at first. Now we're saying you can't have an awning over five feet because it goes against our, our projections ordinance. I think we're going to have to get into that because otherwise you're not going to be able to have dining against the buildings that has any sort of winter protection except for four foot or less, and maybe that's not even in the spirit of now what we're doing here with the outdoor ordinance. So to your point, we, we probably need to look at both if we're going to want to push people toward the building again, and I'm not suggesting that's a bad idea. 
I don't want to get into this situation, though, where we're giving up 90% of the sidewalk and maintaining just five feet so that one restaurant gets a 30-foot wide space because they live, you know, we, we got to be careful about that. But, but I think you're right. I think we do need to look at ultimately when we come to that decision, it's going to impact the projection ordinance as well. One question we might ask the fire marshal, because uh, I don't know, if, if these spaces are being used year-round, does that um, have a sprinkler outside or with the or with you know the plumbing right there on an outside wall which you can't do in residential construction anymore is that going to be an issue or i don't know i i i don't know anything about those systems but they're dry systems. i know water freezes at 32. They're, they're, are they dry i don't know i'm sure they're there are other yeah. like air propelled and most from what i understand for example the rose discussion all they have to do is pop the heads out there doesn't have to be any piping they just have to pop the heads out of the wall so that three inches so there wouldn't be any room to freeze but there's water in that exterior I just ask no I get I get yeah. you my concern is actually what if the awning goes away or the umbrellas go down we've you spent all it. this time looking at facades and building materials and now we're gonna what we're just gonna let them do whatever they want popping six or eight heads out do we want it? <sighs> can you take pictures of the, the, the one or two systems we get Bistro Joe's and and Market North yes that would all right, let, let's keep moving because I think we're, we're making progress here. Getting toward Mr. Williams' comment, we'll start first with the railings. You've got a definition of enclosure, which I have to admit I'm a little confused by, so we don't have to go through it today, but it still doesn't necessarily tell me that I can't have walls. Um, I just Maybe it's the way I read it. It's just a little, maybe it's just building code wonky, but we need to play with that. But the railings, you talk about them being permanent, you know, immovable, so they're not going to be, you know, these planters, they get shuffled around. I'm all in favor of that. But you talk about them being fastened to the sidewalk. Do we want every single restaurant that does outdoor dining to drill into our sidewalks? Does, I mean, does engineering or DPW have, or DPA you know, services have any questions or concerns about that? Seems Not really. Really? That I've heard of. Paul complained about that. <laughs> well, that was when we got our new South Old Woodward streetscape <laughs> where people wanted to drill and he said it's you know it's a brand right. new streetscape, we don't really want that. But the complaints now from the city manager and the building official are it has to be drilled in or it's going to get moved. That's Even right. if it's a hundred pound planter, they just get moved. So the only way to avoid it, according to them, is to have it drilled in. What about metal railings that interconnect and not just requiring some form of railing that interconnects that has defined lengths and whatnot? I mean, you're going to get a little deflection, but Bert, I mean, do you have any? Like TSA at the airport? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Jason, I don't know if you have any opinions know. on. I don't know. I mean, you know, I do think of some things, and these are building code things, but the uplift on these things, when we talk about safety, that, you know. That, that thing better be strapped down really good. <laughs> yeah, that's why I think Someday your cost, these in other I think the cost on some of these are, are residential umbrellas. I've seen some of these between 10, yeah, 10 to 20 grand okay. Quite possible. for commercial. Yeah. Um, Scott, well, about what you're, yeah, about please. these railings. Um, I don't much care if they're railings or planter boxes or whatever they are, um, you know, I think my biggest concern about planters was they kept getting moved. Mm -hmm. And and I think we had one architect who was doing kind of funky ones and they were different and they were round and they were along, you know, and so those were really hard to understand if they were in, a, in the right place or not. So um, I don't know about attaching them or not attaching them, but they just can't move. Yeah. So I don't know if that means we, we right on the concrete with some kind of markings that sh that the restaurant's responsible um, regularly to make sure that their planters are lined up where they're supposed to be or I don't know but but they can't get moved around so uh, in, in my opinion the, the the biggest violator of the five foot is is Birmingham pub which has the most easily movable and least contiguous kind of structure and the one and Scott may disagree, but if you go through toast, it's five feet every single day. Uh, maybe not when you get down to that, that one table, mm -hmm. but between the two established areas, it's five feet no matter what. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a great prison. Uh, <laughs> prison. 
Um, <laughs> Small fence. Maybe, Nick, we're, I think we're all in agreement that it's got to be a movable of some form, but perhaps we can look into the engineering department and DPS and city manager and just get some input on whether they want us to go that route. Yes. Now to Mr. Williams. Mr. Chairman? Yes. A quick question. This is just trying to re refresh my memory. We're discussing this because of alcohol or because of our own regulations? Windbreaks, I think. Is no, no. No, the, just the, the, the rail or yes, something the around railing. the... Uh, is it because of alcohol? No, it's ours. No. So there just needs, there doesn't even need to be a railing for alcohol. No, it just needs I've, to be clearly defined. De five five five. Demarcated. So... We, we, we're, we're, we're beginning to discuss incredible detail about our own regulations. That's right. Yes. And it's okay. to prevent so, table and chair creep. I mean, I, 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 I don't wish to do this because I know we always complain about it when other people do it. But I'll do it. When you go to France or go to Italy or go to Greece or whatever, they don't demarcate the area. The seats determine where you are. In fact, they make a, a point of each individual cafe having their own colour of seat, so you're, you know which waiter is going to come and serve you. So there's not an issue, but, really. But there is, because the Michigan Liquor Control Council says it's got to be designated somehow, demarked. Okay, so it, so it is doesn't have about alcohol. So, so it is about alcohol. So it is about alcohol. It just has to be clearly to agree, defined. It has to be clearly defined. So how do you clearly define that? You can tape on the floor, I suppose. Okay, so uh, that's what I'm trying to get at. It, it, it is to designate an area where alcohol can be so served. Right. Yes. Okay, good enough. Does it need to be a fixed? Does it need to be a metal? Does it need to be a wall? Does it need to be of a certain height? Those are our rules. Those, those are, are our rules. These are our, there are all our rules. Right. Based on a desire to ensure five foot pass being clear. Great. Okay. So we can be, we, we, we can allow our, my, the point I'm trying to say is, we can allow our restaurants and cafes to use their own system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not, we're not yeah. currently saying you can only have metal railings that are drilled in. That's what I'm we're getting at. That they have that's to exactly what I'm fixed. getting at. But I think, I think the point that's being made is that that system right now is failing. That, that we have cases around town where we're being told that the five foot clear is not being maintained because the restaurants using their own systems are doing whatever the hell they want. Okay. And, and every single waiter that comes in a different shift moves the table or the chairs slightly differently, okay. causing on tight streets problems for those that are just trying to walk down the street. Okay. I, and let's add to that, just for the record, because the city manager made us aware of it, that the Department of Justice sent us, as well as many other community, letters about violations of the American with Disabilities Act related to outdoor dining platforms and pedestrian space on sidewalks because of outdoor dining due to COVID. Okay. Okay. I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm learning now. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm just trying to I look for flexibility and not pinning ourselves down to certain things which are include or not drilling into this street. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think the next one was Mr. Williams. You know, we said no walls, but... I won't be in an enclosure. We won't be in an enclosure. Um, <laughs> but what about windbreaks, Mr. Williams? Well, I, I think we tentatively agreed at the last meeting that uh, subject to a certain height that they would be a good idea. Um, but, um, and I think we heard from today that having them attached to the building and extending out is not a problem from fire suppression. So I don't see any reason why we wouldn't have them as long as we maintain the clearance. And the height that was suggested? Yeah. Not, and it, it has to be clear. 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 Five feet or something? Well, yeah. do we want clear all the way up or clear from a railing height up to the max of, you know? It was only from the railing height. I think it was from railing height up at least. Clear, clear from 42 um, inches. Just one clear thing. You talked inches. about definitions earlier. I think this is a thing that needs to be defined, windbreak, once we decide on it. It should yeah. be a definition. No, that's a fair point. You, you would generally agree with the dimensions and what we've been talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I've come around a little on windbreaks since we last met. Um, <laughs> I'll start with that. Um, Which way? Yes. Your you direction. Um, your, um, I think when we started talking about defining the areas, at least in my mind, part of that was this bigger discussion about windbreaks, right? Because 
they're going to have to go in somewhere into something or attached to a railing or stuck in a planter. So there's some sort of way to, to have to make them work. Um, and so with that, I just, I know we, we've said they might be allowed on two ends or the street side or we're not sure yet exactly. I know we're still working through that. But like, for example, where you pointed out on toast today, I think that would be not very attractive to have windbreaks on your right and left, you know, on those walls next to each other. So I think we just have to be careful where we let them be because we could end up in some trouble. So I, I, I guess this probably is more of a case by case and I guess they're gonna have to bring us a drawing and we're gonna have to look at it, but um, I wouldn't be opposed to them on more than one side. I think two um, and maybe even three in some cases might be okay. But again, we also have to come up with months, right? So right. when do we want these things to go up and when do we want them to come down? That's another Good question. Yeah. That's another, yeah. um, question because question. we don't want them up all summer or I don't right. know. Fair point. Um, I tend to agree with you. Um, I would say the four sides is probably fine if it's done right. And we're talking clear and it's only up to 60 inches and it's certain times a year. Yeah, maybe. I think that would probably be fine. Have to, I think we'd have to see it, right? Like yeah. on a case by case with a drawing. and have to see all these case by case anyway. Yeah. yeah. And of course, we would be sure to bring them, especially if it's newly minted. We would never consider administrative approval for these until we're right. mm -hmm. yeah. well into it. So what about material for windbreaks? That's another one on my list. Well, that's something we're going to have to figure <laughs> out, yeah. I mean, cle no clear. No clear. No, not so well. <laughs> right. Yeah. Visual some, light some transmit. No, I'm cement. kidding. Um, <laughs> well, and you brought up the next question, the last one I actually had on my little list, <clears throat> which gets to, which is an extension of this, which gets to the picture that, that I ranted on earlier. The idea of a, a facility, a restaurant that has outdoor dining on the sidewalk adjacent to the building and wants outdoor dining in a deck out in a parking space. Mm -hmm. And the more and more I think about this, the more and more I've seen it, the more and more I've seen that, the more and more I saw what was up at Luxo during COVID. I got to tell you, I just don't think they should be allowed both. I agree. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's easy. Mm -hmm. You're passing through something, not past something. So would you think that they could have one during, call it the winter, and one during the summer? In other words, different your shift between them? Interesting question. Yeah, I guess. Interesting question. Yeah. Mm. It seems I'm sure like they could. care. I guess the question goes, I mean, stepping back, why did we do this ordinance in the first place and is it still valid? Do we want, do we prefer dining against the building on the sidewalk? We're kind of talking about decks as if we don't care, but do yeah. we have a preference? I think yeah. prefer, yeah. Yeah. Generally yeah. speaking. I don't necessarily. Yeah, where did we get away from it? We got away from it right at Woodward and Maple, right? Yeah. Brooks? Would it be reasonable to recommend that if you want an on-street deck and sidewalk dining that your passable space increases, say that you're required to go from 5 to 10? Yeah, I think you get either or, man. Yeah, 10. One or the uh, other. Okay, I, I'll be devil's advocate on this. This, on a Sunday morning, you're sitting there, that to me is the most activated of any place in the city. It is, I love it. I mean, it is like people walk through there. But, I but you want to walk it. through that, and I hate it. I go down two streets. People to walk avoid through it. there because they want to check it out too. I mean, it's like the cars out front of two twenty on a night. They they want to they want to go where there's people on both sides of them. Sidewalks are for people. I don't know. Um, I just. I think this is go to Lincoln Avenue in Miami. You got dining on both sides. It's the coolest place in all you know South Beach yeah, down there. That's awesome. two hundred feet wide. Yeah. It's a uh, different story. Well, that is okay. Go down Ocean Boulevard. It's, it's on both sides, and that is people love to go through there. And I don't want to make it unsafe or anything. Um, I mean, maybe Brooks has got a good point. Maybe because your jail thing. Terrible. Maybe you open it up another foot or so. But one thing is, terrible. that's that's always the defined space. I think that's. Oh, uh, what what do you awesome. object to? Do you object to the reduced space, or do you object to the railing? Um. I, to me, they're they're hand in hand. I mean, because because. I mean, the, 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 the example you gave at Lux, they don't have railings. Right. So the, to me, mostly it's the space. Mostly it's the idea that I that the sidewalk is being almost entirely just co-opted by the business, and pedestrians are an afterthought. I think 
think the railing makes it worse, mm -hmm. though, because, like, if there were just a couple of two top tables tight to the building and not the railing and you walked through there, I think it gives you a different feeling. This 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 feels worse with the railing. But they put up a four top and then you're three feet. Right. Then they put up a four top and someone scooches out. Right. But they're not supposed to. <laughs> yeah, but they're not supposed to move the plants. <laughs> it sounds like we've got a slight difference of opinion as to how sidewalks function. My experience from years and years of walking in downtown is that a crowded sidewalk is not a problem. I mean, I've, I've been there, you know, walked through crowds, you know, sometimes myself, sometimes with the dog. Um, you know, it hasn't bothered me at all. I it's because you had a German Shepherd with you. No, no. <laughs> no. Uh, the sweetest dog in the world, <laughs> un unless you were a dog. Um, but where I've had problems and, and felt uncomfortable is either feel, feeling hemmed in. So those rails mm -hmm. make you feel hemmed in. It discourages you. The exper my experience walking through Lux, when Lux had that thing down it made me feel hemmed in it made yes. me feel like it was part of the the sidewalk had been co-opted in the restaurant once that has been gone i've not had a problem or felt uncomfortable walking through that space even though the tables are in the same spot and you got might have to weave in and out between the the servers and what have you so but it, the condition that that has bothered me is the feeling of enclosure but, but what about our friends in this community that that have vision impairment or, or other impairments that it's not as easy to just weave in and out. And, and uh, it seems to me that the city is giving restaurants public land for their use. And they're doing it to encourage activity on the street. But at some point, the city needs to make a decision. And maybe this is a policy issue, but we're here to, we're here to provide recommendations on land use policy, I suppose. How much is enough, you know? Um, you know, the, I don't know. You've no, heard my it's, opinion. It's I don't fair, need to repeat it. Point. Mm -hmm. Deflect Bert? just a, a, a little bit. You know, I think a big, 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 big part of this, the major part of it is more dining, more people eating, I make more money. Right. And it's free space. It's a lot less expensive than buying a building. You could have overhead garage doors that all of a sudden take you into your space and make it part of that, that environment. Um, the, the other thought I have is that when, when, they, when they created this bistro license, I think they specifically, I think of Tallulah's, it was dead over there. Mm -hmm. So they said, let's not have six of these in a row. They said, let's do one there. Let's do one over here. Let's do one over here. So you had these nodes of a little bit of this going on. But now we have situations. And during COVID, by the way, I wasn't walking around town a lot, you know, so <laughs> it was, it was so, and, and if I was, I wasn't there making observations about, do I like this, don't I like it, so, um, but, you know, the, the street side next to Ely's, and of course you've got construction next to it, so that makes it, it even help. worse, but, but it's just, it just looks like wow. stuff just parked up there, and, and, and even this, I mean, if you looked at this closely, you know, I mean, there's it's, there's an offset, there's a tree, there's a garbage thing, there's a, uh, a uh, um, what's it called, a fire extinguisher, there's a, you know, it's, so you, you have to, I don't mind it as much when they're sort of sprinkled amongst, but you start lining up a lot. Can you imagine this condition times two? Uh, you know, I, 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 it would be almost like, Confusing, especially if it was highly activated on a Sunday morning or something like that. So, sure. Um, so I was talking a, a, a different. I talked to a lot of restaurant guys. So, um, and they said, you know, okay. Oh, oh, I was asking them about food trucks because we haven't gotten a lot of input on that. So I've been asking some guys. He said, uh, no, you, you want it. He goes. In a restaurant business, you want more restaurants, more eating options around you. It draws in people. Everybody wins. And so he was talking about New York. He goes, in New York, he goes, you look. He goes, you'll have a row of Italian restaurants. You want to go over Italian, you're going to that street, and everybody's there, you know. And I think, yeah, okay. I mean, if that whole, if that whole road, that whole side, and we put them all there, it would look great. It would look like it was supposed to be there. I don't know that I agree with that. But, 
but like but then you got Tallulah. You know, if you go over there, you're you're in no man's land. So from a business standpoint, you know, they it's a huge gamble. To, I don't know. Is that two different awnings just butted up next to each other? Mm -hmm. They're attached. But because they were they done at the same time? Were they done at separate times? I think to go around the tree. <laughs> no, it was done all at once. Are they two different colors? No, they're both black. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's just the way the picture looks. Yeah, it's because the deck jogs. I see. Okay. You see these things when so if somebody wants the polka dots. Purple neon it is. I I don't I don't recall if this moved forward. Out of a slot. Yeah. So if yeah. if uh, if it exists now, we're not going to change it. They're grandfathered. Till they have to fix not. something. Uh, <laughs> Till they have to fix something. <laughs> well. Yeah. Or change it ours. Don't they get reviewed every year? Anyway? <laughs> I, I thought you can review it. Anyway. They get reviewed every year anyway, right? Yeah, it's a yearly. You don't get a liquor licenses do. But so does outdoor dining, right? Yeah. It's not a yearly permit. Oh yeah, yeah. We review them in the planning division. Yeah. yeah. You don't get a. So yeah, we but... can clean up some messy stuff if we yeah. want. We have that ability. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Let's keep that. Nick. So I don't want to be belabor this, but just as an observation, this particular deck, the curb is more out here. This comes out into the sidewalk, oh, over yeah, the does. curb. Mm -hmm. So that obviously exacerbates the condition. We don't see very many decks that do this. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Pinching so down on the tree, uh, taking the furniture. This out. might be a unicorn, if you will. So it goes all the way into the aggregate, which is mm -hmm. maybe three feet in that area. Oh, wow. if, if you can imagine it three feet out, like this side is, it's not going to feel as enclosed. And that's the majority of our decks. Now, again. So how much area around that tree? Does that even, is that going to kill that tree? Yes. yes. Huh? huh? That's a good question. I'll bring that up with DPS. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty Wait. tight. Okay. Um, we can, do we, we can have any sort of, do we have any, do we don't seem to have a consensus on this particular point. <laughs> so, you um, do. I forgot what the point. No, I've got a point. <laughs> 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 so, Nick, I don't know what to tell you. I'm moving this one forward on a draft, but you've heard what we've said. So I think we need to, to bring this back to our next study session and kind of wade through these last few questions. Just, just if I heard based on uh, Robin's question, we're not going to allow paint on the, on the sidewalk to define the, that space for what right. abuts the building. So it's going to be a railing? Something. Or planters or planters. something. So you're, you're always going to have that corridor effect. So, and it's five foot minimum. With five foot, two people walking in one direction. And, and, they, and they that's don't, the other thing. This feels very, kind of long also. They don't, want, so. they don't want planters there because they'd lose right, seats. Double seat, yeah. yeah, we maybe shouldn't let that happen again. And those are drilled into the sidewalk, I presume, it looks like. It must be. Yeah. Yes. Well, are they? But the table, the tables go right up to the railing. So it can't be paint. I'm, I'm not saying it should be paint, but like if that railing wasn't there and there was a line that defined the area so that it complied with the liquor license, mm -hmm. wouldn't that feel better? Until the chairs start moving six, eight, twelve inches out into the yeah. sidewalk. I know, but be, paint on the sidewalk would yeah. show the manager and the staff that hey. Yeah. You but need to but then Nick's out there every day looking at this, you know, every lunch hour to make sure that there's. This place allows dogs <laughs> too, so that's. An but issue. but picking up um, Mr. Shear's comments, which I think is that if we if we take ourselves back to that section in in, in the in the art the gallery district as we used to call it, and you walk down the hill adjacent to Lux before COVID. You may you manage to walk through that area very comfortably, on my humble opinion, with the with the tables adjacent to the window and some at the outside. They were on the sidewalk. When you got down to Sal's, as it's now called, you have a very nice um, seating beside the building, and then you turn the corner and there they've got a small deck on the on the far side. So you. What I'm saying is, if we if we if we only look at a picture like that that you think is negative then we don't see the value of what we've got in other parts of the city. That's what I'm trying to get at. And that's fair. Maybe we, if you've got pictures of others, I'd love to see them. You know, I mean, I mean... I just disagree with you that I don't... I didn't find Lux comfortable before the, the overhang. 
Okay, it's, all right. I, I mean, we, it's, it's, we, it's we just disagree. On, we just disagree. That's we, dis we disagree on that that's one. Fine. And we're so, not going to probably agree. But no, that's fine. I, I'm saying that we, we, we've done a good job with most of our bistros. That's basically what I'm saying. No, and I would agree. Um, there is another issue we need to talk about for Monday night. I'm wondering, is there any other wrap up here on this? I, I have one thing I want to, one point I want to make, which is it touches on something you said earlier. Uh, in fact, the definition of enclosure does not work with subsection three, um, on what is it? Um, the outdoor dining design stuff C. So I'm happy to explain that to you, um, Nick offline. So we don't have to take the time, but. I, I work through it. You cannot build anything. You, know, you, you literally can't have any wall the way those two interact. All right. Well, so, great. Problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe, maybe that's what we want. Wonderful. A good Send one. Find more, more of that. Find more of that. Right, yeah, please do. Send yeah. a feed to the chair. Please do. Um, Sorry, you might see me. Is there any other thing else to wrap up this conversation? Nick, anything else you need to help get us to the next time before we get into the final discussion from Monday? The direction's great. Okay. And I think at the next meeting, we could have some um, help in that the Birmingham Shopping District okay. is wrapping up their their memo, uh, and they're, they've reached out to their constituents, if you will, and we might get answers to these, or at least a little bit of help slash direction to kind of nudge us one way or the other. Good. That is my current plan for the next study session of this, okay. is to go over that, because I think it's going to be good, and I think it's going to warrant it. What's our deadline? Yeah. We didn't we talk about spring? Well, you know, let, yeah, yeah we're, let's talk about that. I mean, yeah. we're going to talk about something right now in a second uh, from Monday night. But the reality is, I think that where we're at, I don't see there's any reason why we can't have an ordinance to the commission in the first quarter next year. Right. Do you? No. no. I mean, I think we're making very good progress. And we've just got a couple of sticky decisions to... We get. And then the details and materials and other things. Like, what does that really mean? <clears throat> well, three resignations along the way will be good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, good good work, Ward. I appreciate that. Um, Nick, you, let's get into Monday night and what the commission talked about. Okay, so it's, it's funny we had this conversation, and now we're going to talk about something that's just going to throw a wrench right into it. <laughs> but um, at the Joint City Commission and Planning Board meeting, a, a couple of both planning board and city commissioners had mentioned that they're interested in exploring some options to help outdoor dining and restaurants now, this year. They feel as though the COVID-19 pandemic has not necessarily, excuse me, necessarily led up with all the new variants and all the anxiety that's still out there. We have been directed to study an ordinance amendment or amendments um, to change the November 15th end date for the regular outdoor dining season. With, with the intention of keeping outdoor dining patios, including dining decks, year-round. So it could be as simple as removing that date. Um, we could also address the tables and chairs issue right. at the same time, so that we do uh, kind of two birds with one stone. And at this point, it feels like it, act, it could actually act as that bit of a trial that Mr. Sherrill was asking about. We could have the decks out this winter and see how it works. And this is a direction of the city commission, so um, here we are. But it could have a dual purpose. We could get a free trial period, if you will, because a couple of months later, we're going to have this new, more comprehensive ordinance come along for adoption. Was there, was there a time period question? ASAP. No, no, no. Oh. Time period for the extension. Year-round until when? I, I think that was left to us, Mr. Williams. I think the reality yeah. is... is they, so there wasn't a... No, but as, as Nick mentioned, I think... Oh. There wasn't an end date special. They did not. But the reality, as Nick mentioned, is that since we are working yeah. on another ordinance that we're hoping to, to pin down in the first quarter of next year, and since regular dining season, as it currently is, is defined, starts, what is it, April 15th, right? April 1st, is. maybe. We're um, really talking about a, like a five-month... November 15th to April 1st. Extension. So you, until we figure out the rest of this. I had heard that from a commissioner that their understanding was that that it goes it, it goes as it is right now until this ordinance yeah. gets approved. We're saying the same thing. So it could it could be February twelfth, it could be Whenever it could be April. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly. right. So exactly. like would we potentially suggest we extend the status quo until like 
January 1st, 2023. I think we get into trouble when we start getting into temporal zoning. I mean, we're, which is the term I want to use more and more because it's kind of fun, <laughs> uh, even though it has nothing to do with the space-time continuum. Um, I might suggest, since we are working on this other ordinance, the, the easiest way to do this would be to just modify the ordinance as it sits now to eliminate the reference to dates so that there's no longer a quote-unquote season and to address the situation of tables and chairs having to be pulled in every night. If we eliminated those requirements, then anybody that currently has approval could keep it going until a new ordinance comes along, which we're hoping to have quarter one, what have you, of next year anyway. We don't know. Yeah, TBD, but... So if we come back with a more restrictive ordinance mm -hmm. later and want to change it to that and people have invested thinking that they'll forever get to do whatever they want... Then they will yell at the city commission. Right, right. so yes. so is, is it a better idea to put a date to it? Specific? I mean, if we're going to come back in March... So we don't get ...change it at? anyway, well... I don't know. That would be a good topic for next door. They're going to do a communication. I mean, we could cover some of that in the communication. Yeah, we're going to be sending a letter out to restaurants, letting them know that we're studying this. <laughs> and additionally, um, the city manager has indicated that we will be pausing enforcement of that November 15th deadline. So we're not going to ask anybody to take their stuff down and put it back up in December. Do the, uh, sorry, are you Hold on, let, 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 do Mr. The, Chair. Do the permits that people have gotten for outdoor dining currently have a... November 15th yes. deadline yes. to them? Yes, you do. So are they going to have to reapply to extend that? That Even if we change the zoning ordinance, doesn't their permit need to be modified? Which we can't do. It could be up to us whether or not we require that the zoning ordinance currently states that you have to receive an extended outdoor dining permit if you want to uh, have an outdoor dining patio past November 15th. We could realistically take that out as a part of this, or we could leave it in and require everybody to reapply. So it would just be an administrative approval until we get, I mean, we're not yeah. talking about something new. We're talking something that's sitting there right now. Well, that, that's, I don't want to overthink this, I guess, is my that, point. That's part of the point, is if, if you just kind of eliminate the, the requirement, then, you know, anybody that doesn't have one can just throw one up. So, you know, somebody administratively needs to think through, you know, whether there's some bulk way of extending the permits without involving uh, us. I don't... You know, well, I don't it, 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 I mean, they'd have to involve us if it's a brand new deck. Well, if it's a new deck, yeah. But, but I if mean, someone uh, has one and yeah. just wants to keep it going, I think that's an administrative issue. But, but the issue. point is that, that, that as to the restaurant, it's decided by permit. Mm -hmm. right? And the permit needs to be extended in right. some fashion, whether by ordinance or by application. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. But we can't just be silent as to it. But I don't think that if it's a permit, I don't think that's our issue. No, I don't think it is. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an issue for Mr. It's for our Mr. issue Marcus if it's and, not dealt with in the ordinance. But the ordinance doesn't get into the permit, I guess. And when we're talking about something without in front of us, so maybe we should hold this argument for for later. But I guess what I would like to suggest is that we have Nick draft <laughs> uh, um, a revised ordinance for those two points, and we'll take this in under advisement as to whether or not there's anything further. Um, November 10th, you're going to... For a November 10th, <coughs> at which point we'll set a public hearing, hold the public hearing, and if we move it forward, we move it forward, and then commission can in take it. In the meantime, the city will determine how it's going to enforce right. current... Okay. And we'll continue to move forward on our fuller okay. definition, or fuller outdoor dining project as well. All right. So, all right. I, I don't have any problem with that. Is there any concern? I mean, it seems reasonable considering what we've been asked to do. The, the question is, at what point on November 10th are you going to raise this issue? You're going to raise it at the end. You're going no, to have to. We're going to be on the agenda. At what point in the agenda? Because you got the master asking, plan. Do you want to do this oh. first or master plan first? I think you got to do the master plan well, we first. We can talk about that offline, but 100 people showing up. Yeah, we'll do the master plan first for sure. Okay. I have another issue, no. unrelated to. Okay, let's just close this one out. Any other concerns or questions related to that? No. It can be spotted in public. Nick, you're solid? I think I'm very right. solid. Mr. Williams. Okay, so um, as I looked at the schedule that we have, uh, I became concerned that under our current process, we're going to sort ignore all site plan approvals until some point in January, unless we decide that we're going to mix site plan approvals with the master plan discussion, which, frankly, I am against. I just say this. I think we ought to consider a special meeting in December 
solely for the purpose of site plan. <coughs> if nothing comes forward, the meeting gets canceled. Do we have anything on the agenda right, or on the, the books right now from a site plan perspective? We have no applications, and I've only received a question about one. So if it doesn't happen, we haven't jeopardized anybody, and I would suggest that the most likely date is the third week of December, not November. When do we have um we have a meeting on December eight. eight. So my thought is fifteenth or sixteenth. Are there any bistros that applied that are coming forward? We don't know yet. Well, that's Nothing's happening on November eighth. Pardon? There are and it's happening on November eighth. Oh, okay, they see them on November eighth. Selection okay. process, yep. All right. So there could be something coming. There could be. So I'm just saying let's tentatively agree on a date if we if nothing comes forward the meeting gets canceled we've canceled meetings in the past what i'd like to do instead of scheduling an actual special meeting and well, i don't think yet, you have to do it until the november meeting yeah let's let's I'm Nick, just maybe raising you can, the issue now that if somebody shows up with a site plan approval i don't want because we don't know what it's going to be and we don't know how controversial it's going to be and I also, don't want that to, with the planning I also don't want to jam it in on a, a special meeting, you know, right before a holiday if it is controversial, too. I mean, I mean, well, we'll, we'll so. deal with that. But I don't know when else you would fit it in. Let's, Nick, if you could look at the schedule for the 15th and just see what rooms were, what's available. Is this room even available on that date? It'd have to be the 16th, which is a Thursday. Okay. So we'll just think about it as we get closer to that uh, November 10th and we'll decide We can decide, decide in that. November. Yep, okay. that's good. Uh, any other communications or administrative approvals, Nick? Um, yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> Why did you ask? I know. It's on the thing. I have to read it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just have one, one <laughs> approval level question. This is at the Hearths, Hearthside Condos on Southfield Road. They're doing a repaving project in their current drive aisle, which comes in off so Southfield here, just the back area. Where are these? Where is this? Um, Where? It's on, it's about the 600 level of Southfield Road right here. Oh, that's the, uh, oh, yeah, that's the little things. courtyard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I've seen that. Yeah. That's what we thought was cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a single-family oh, yeah. cluster, so it falls under our purview, even though it's in an R2 yeah, or R1. R1. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So the only issue is they're planning to remove this landscape island back here for drainage, and there's a big, massive tree in it. And it, technically, that's a downgrade. I mean, they're not proposing currently to replace the tree. So when it comes to those kind of questions, we bring it here uh, first to make sure that either A, you're okay with an administrative approval, B, if you'd like to see anything What's different. to the left of the tree? It's all, it's like a circle drive over here. So what is the plan going to look like? Is it all going to be pavement now? Uh, it's right here. So it's pavement plus Three. a little bit of a, let me see if I can make it bigger for you all. What is that? Oh, okay. Oh, God. Do, do they have a real... French drain. Do they have a real problem? I don't is there really a know. drainage problem there? Is there? Yeah, it seems like it's mounded up. Um, is there a French is there a drain now? This? No, it's it's a raised landscape bed now. I don't know that so You can see it's kind of... Like yeah, so the, the water's draining off. So... They just, I think they just repaved, if I remember right. It, it looks pretty, pretty yeah. clean back there. How many houses are back there? I don't There's even tell. Five or six total. So it goes all the way around. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, so I hate to lose trees in general. So it's not really an upgrade to the site unless you consider the drainage advantages, which I don't know the problems. They, I guess I haven't really spoken with the individual homeowners. But. Of course, I can explore tree replacement with them. I don't know how that fits into these plans. Um, but it does take, uh, you know, it takes a mature tree out, and we would. Is that like a depression and a drain in there? This this new plan would be. Is that what's proposed? Yeah, they would, they would direct, they would uh, grade it so all the water goes there into that French drain. I mean, there are a lot of trees back there already, but. I guess I don't know. I don't know if that's the right So I think you got to find out if there's a drainage problem from yeah. resulting from this. There may be. If there's an existing drainage problem. Yeah. I mean, they I... want to fix. There must be a reason they're doing this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Well, I mean, there's a, another house on Southfield where they put in, I don't know, an acre of concrete. Um, 
apparently so that they could turn cars around easier, I, I guess. Um, it doesn't fit my taste, and if I were the czar, I wouldn't have let him do it. But, you know, I, I, this doesn't, you know, make me feel comfortable. I, I think there's options, personally. I, I've got an issue at our cabin, and, and you know, we, you can run, you could run across that and do a trench with, you know, with a grate and have that go down to a French drain, and it's miraculous. I've I've had houses that I've listed that had five, six inches of water in the backyard, and you, you do two French drains, and it's it's amazing. So I I think there's options, but... Is there more to it than this, or is this the only plan? This is the only plan I have currently. Because that doesn't tell this. you anything about which way the water is going, which way yeah. the drainage is going. It just has that trench in the middle. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Who engineered it? doesn't say what the grades are on the outside. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Oh if I live God. there, I really wouldn't want to do that. So it does It does contain a note that it's going to be landscaped as a part of a second project oh. up here of the Homeowners Association. That makes me feel better. But generally it's hard to... It's hard to approve things with the condition that yeah. they reapply for the landscaping project and then, you know, babysit yeah. them until we get that, but... Well, Nick, I think you've heard that there's a little discomfort here as far as what the intent is and what the overall scope of the project is. If they can provide you detail that well, what makes the us reason for it is. the reason, <laughs> they can provide you more detail, maybe bring it back again administratively if they want to do that. We'll give you more input, or okay. else you can just have them submit. It's really your call at that point. Okay. Okay. So I think I know what makes me feel more comfortable, and it sounds like we're kind of sure. vibing. So. Okay. All right. Uh, draft agenda for November 10th. Uh, right now, I believe we just have the master plan, correct, Nick? Right now, yes. Okay. We left so that, that intentionally, but right. as I understand it, we might want to add this outdoor dining. Well, we need to at least talk about the outdoor dining related to the request from the City Commission. Yes. You know, uh, is there a desire to talk about the further outdoor dining, or are we going to be pretty well swamped with the master plan, <laughs> I believe, right? <laughs> All right. Master plan. So, Nick, I think you we're doing the, the special request, and then we'll do mm -hmm. the master plan, draft two, chapter one. And then, and then you'll... You'll talk about whether we, you'll know, I think, by then whether we're going to need a special right. meeting or not. All right, any other business? I just have a question. Last meeting I asked about that uh, house setback thing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, do you think we'll be able to have any information about that? Sure, and, and may I ask, what kind of information are you looking for? Just like a end of meeting communication type no, thing? Are we, will, are we going to be able to study, well, like a a study session to change the ordinance? Or figure out if we need to even, I guess. Gotcha, gotcha. Kind of so I haven't gained an audience with Bruce yet. He's currently on vacation for like 10 days. Oh, wow. Oh. And that's who That's who I'd really like to talk to before I bring it Okay. Back. Yeah, that's great. But, um, okay. But, but please, keep reminding me because it, it helps. <laughs> okay. It really does. All right, any other business? Just a little announcement. I, I happen to come across a really interesting uh, web page if you're interested in understanding what other cities are doing with social zones. And the, and the variety there is M Live, which some of you might read. At the end of May, May 31 of this year, had a summer guide to outdoor social districts in Michigan, where it lists all the municipalities, of which there are 40, and all the different types, whether they're connected to bars or restaurants, or bars and restaurants, and the outdoor seating and streets that are closed and all the rest of it. It's pretty cool. Northville was one, right? Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, there are, there's 40 municipalities that have these things in the summer. Where they are now is another question. Okay. Great. Cool. Thanks. With that, thank you, everybody. Uh, meeting adjourned.